today is we're looking at S47. Um, we will uh, take a few minutes of additional um, testimony. You want to testify, Brandon? I, I'm happy to go after Dan. I know he was on the agenda, so yeah, I understand but, we're, we're opposing. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So do you want to join us? And yeah. just for your information, committee, um, don't make snorting noises while Dan is... Um, uh, testifying because he's going to be they're going to be live streaming his testimony and I I just want to warn you about that so that um, we are well behaved to have 50,000 VPRG members and supporters looking at you yes <laughs> yes so oh no looking at you none of them are at work right well they might, they might look at it later <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to just introduce yourself and yes point? yes for the record my name is Daniel Brown I'm the government reform advocate with VPRG Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to come testify uh, in favor of S-47, an act which would limit campaign contributions from corporate entities. In general testimony, um, before the committee earlier this session, VPIRG noted that we supported a ban on corporate contributions in the past, so it should come as no surprise that we're here offering strong support for S-47, which would ensure that contributions to a candidate or political party would come only from an individual, a political party, or a political committee. As you know, Vermont currently treats corporations in the same manner that it does human beings in terms of the contributions each is allowed to make, but corporations are not human beings and they should not be afforded the same opportunities to influence our elections here in Vermont. Corporations have certain advantages over human beings, such as limited liability and unlimited life as a matter of public policy, but these advantages were intended to encourage the marketplace to flourish and they were not intended to result in undue influence over our political process. Admittedly, it is not just corporate money that corrupts our political process. Big money from individuals is certainly problematic as well. But while the Supreme Court has limited our options in terms of curtailing contributions from individuals, the court has repeatedly found that bans on direct corporate contributions to candidates and political parties stands on firm constitutional footing. And I've included two articles, um, one from the Washington Post and one from the Wa uh, Boston Globe, that reference um, ban on corporate campaign contributions standing up at the federal level and Massachusetts state ban also standing up. So S-47 um, is not the only solution we need to the problem of money in politics, but it is undoubtedly an essential ingredient. VPIRG also supports public financing and creating incentives for more small dollar contributions. But passing S-47 is a reasonable, if not groundbreaking, step that you can take right now to address the problem of money in politics. So VPIRG urges you to support and pass S-47. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. And um, we didn't know but the elegant way that it was crafted so that we didn't have to try to um, define what a corporation yes. was and when they were a corporation and when they weren't. But that was our legislative council, Betsy. That was a very elegant move. It was. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for, wait, oh. for Dan? Well, you understand that. My understanding is that corporations could still give money to PACs. Yes, but they would be limited to the same, they would be limited to Vermont PAC limits. So I believe that's $4,000 adjusted for inflation. Yeah. Just want to make sure that Thank you. Thank you. Brandon? Uh, for the record, uh, Brandon Batham. I am the Director of Party Operations at the Vermont Democratic Party. Um, so uh, we are here, um, we, we, we know this, this came through as S120 uh, uh, last year. Um, and uh, unfortunately we, we did not testify at the time. We had a chance to provide input and testimony on the House side. And so a lot of what I'm sharing uh, today is, is what was shared with the House a year ago, or a little under a year ago. So, uh, you know, in general, uh, I think we can all agree that Citizens United, the Citizens United ruling in 2010 reshaped uh, the political landscape for everybody. Um, dark money and corporate interests uh, in our politics has, has uh, only exploded <coughs> since then. 
And um, the Vermont Democratic Party at its core believes in the effort to eliminate corporate influence in elections and, and in governance. Um, we're just not certain that this bill is going to address that in the best way. So eliminating corporate contributions to candidates and to political parties and to PACs in the state of Vermont, just to parties, just to parties and to candidates, um, you know, is not going to eliminate those dollars from the political sphere. That money is still going to free flow through independent expenditures at the federal level. We've seen them here, and they always come in late and with very, very little transparency about who is funding, uh, who is funding independent expenditures for gubernatorial candidates, mailers attacking or promoting individual legislative candidates. Mm -hmm. We see that happen all the time. Beyond that, we're, we're interested in, in supporting and working with, with this committee and the House Committee on Government Operations to find a way to craft a bill that is not just going to be passable through both chambers and would be signed by the governor, but also would stand the test of the courts. We don't agree that this is a sure thing once it makes its way through the courts. Um, there is case history to support uh, the notion that a ban, uh, a specific ban on, on uh, contributions from a from a, so, a sorted class of, of donors to a political party would likely be struck down. The second court, the second circuit court, circuit court of appeals, uh, ruled in 2010, I believe, uh, in favor of uh, the Green Party of Connecticut v. Garfield. Uh, at the time, the lawsuit alleged that. Um, that the states initially passed ban on lobbyist contributions to political parties and to candidates was, uh, was not constitutional. The court found that because there was a, a degree of separation between decision makers and, uh, and the contributors, that, that a ban between candidates certainly made sense, and I believe they upheld that ban. A ban between, uh, between lobbyists and political parties was not upheld and was struck down. The Second Circuit Court of Appeals, as everyone here knows, I would imagine, uh, is the one who deals with our, our federal court issues when it reaches, when it reaches the appellate uh, level. So we see, um, we certainly see the possibility of, uh, of corporate contributions between individual uh, candidates or elected officials and, and corporations as, as both being something that, that makes sense uh, and also something that would likely stand the test of the courts, a ban between any non-decision-making uh, uh, individual or potential decision-making individual uh, would likely not stand the test given that history. And uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions. That uh, was struck down in Connecticut, did you say? It was the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. It was the Green Party of Connecticut v. Garfield in the year 2010. I'll double check on the year. Yes, 2010. And I, I'm more than happy to email this committee that, uh, that uh, case file. And so uh, do you have a language for us to to look at, or you're just proposing that we only deal with the ban between corporations and candidates? And I think that, frankly, I think that the, given the uncertainty that, that a ban between political parties and, and the language that's been crafted in this bill, the, the potential for that to either be completely struck down by the courts or the entirety of the law itself being struck down by the courts is, is risk enough that it, that it might be worth just limiting the scope of this bill to donations or contributions received by individual candidates. So your proposal is just limiting the scope? Correct. Any other questions? I, I, will, <clears throat> I will say that we've, we've done, I believe, as much as we can around IEPs. And I, I, I don't want us to to independent expenditure um, part um, committees. committees. It, it's the right. it's the it's, it's the, 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 it's the Citizens United um, right. decision, and the Citizens United decision had nothing to do with corporate 
donations. It only addressed those independent expenditure committees. So <clears throat> we we get to we, we shouldn't mix them up because mm -hmm. because we can't control them. We've done as much as we can in the state of Vermont to control them where we can. Well, that's well and I think I'm oh, sorry. Well, that's sort of why I was wondering if you had language on uh, additional language. On well, that. and I think that the I think that you know there 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 is nothing that you can control uh, that you can use to further control independent expenditures in Vermont. I think our concern is that passing passing this law would only take the corporate donations that are already being reported either to individual candidates or to political parties, and they're required to be reported and, and itemized and all of that the, the same way that, that any contribution is in the state of Vermont. Moving that money from one place to another is all that this would be doing. You basically take corporate money that is being spent on elections and donated either to individual candidates or to political parties and are reported as such. Those corporations are still going to spend that money on elections. It's just a question of where are they going to spend it. Are they going to spend it with an entity that they have to report, or are they going to spend it with an entity that they don't have to report and has no, you know, you have no uh, authority over determining what their what their filing sure. requirements are. Well, we do have filing requirements for them, and we do have we can't limit the amount of money that's given to an individual to an IEC from I call them IEPs because it's independent education plans because I think they're so dumb. But the um, we can't we can't c limit the amount that an individual can contribute to them, but we can say that they have to disclose who's giving that amount and where the it's coming from, and they have to report. And we but do, do we that. do that currently? Yes. With a with a PAC that is that is making expenditures in Vermont, with a PAC that's registered or a super PAC that's registered with the FEC, all they would really be required to do is file a mass media report stating what they are what their activity is doing for mass media activities, and that's and I think that's I think that's the distinction is is remove you know, corporations could still and will still give to PACs based on the language in this yep. bill, but they're they're. There, a lot of a lot of what they do, and especially if they they don't feel they can give to a political party or to a candidate directly, they'll just give more on the independent expenditure side with uh, regulated by the FEC or frankly not regulated by the FEC. So anybody will always find a workaround for anything we do. Mm -hmm. Alice, did you have a question? Well, I uh, because I wish I understood the independent expenditure. See a little bit. Me too. <laughs> it, 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 it's entities, right. PACs that make that right independently spend money on a TV ad or on a yeah. mailing or without on a, any contact with the candidate. Without right, with right. no contact with no coordination with the candidate. No, Correct. well, it's different. Right. But it's not contact. I mean, they but contact with the but no okay. coordination. Okay. But what do we? And right now, we require that they disclose their source. The source yeah. ten days before the election or X Betsy, number. Betsy will answer that for us because Betsy will know exactly what it is. I was looking here to find out how we do it, but yes, we do. And, uh, do you want to answer that directly right now? Quickly, yeah. Quick answer. Will Senning, Director of Elections, for the record. Betsy, correct me if I'm wrong. The only distinction in our law in terms of independent expenditure backs is that the limits don't apply to them. Right. Sorry, the limit what? The limits, the contribution limits, do not apply. They're under all the same reporting and disclosure requirements as standard PACs. Yeah. Must disclose and report. everything. So PACs, PACs have to disclose who their contributors are the same way everybody else. Correct. Yes. And why? But we could. Cons is it that we're not able to um, put a contribution yes. on? Yes. Correct. By Citizens That's United. Cool. Ah, that is okay. That could be right. I mean, the courts have said you can't do that. Okay. okay. So we've done what okay. we can do around them, them. but Unless but I take I um, does anybody else want to weigh in on this issue, and then I'm going to ask Betsy to to um, give us some information about the uh, the courts and where she thinks that is. Just echo Betsy quickly. This is just, just identify Josh Massey, sorry, Executive Director of the Vermont Democratic Party. Is it? You know, we're not here to take a position. We do think getting big money out of politics is is the right thing to do. We just want to make sure that it's transparent as possible. 
And the Vermont Democratic Party takes a very, very small amount of corporate money. It's not, not something that we're self-interested in protecting. We just want to make sure it's transparent. Yeah, and, and that's and that's the that's the, the important piece is that it you know this is you know we're not here because we're 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 so desperate for for corporate cash that this bill would, would derail us. I mean, we uh, corporate money accounted for less than six percent of what we actually took in last year, um, and uh, and that's that's counting you know LLC money from people who are attorneys here in Vermont. You know, it's it's not. You know, it, it's this isn't a this isn't a we really want to keep this money conversation. It's a we're we're idealists too. We would really like to, to do everything we can to get big money out of politics. We're just not certain that this bill, as it's written right now, is 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 both going to achieve that goal and not just pass through uh, the Vermont uh, legislative procedure, but also make it through the through the judicial process and vetting. The problem is the only thing that's certain about campaign finance reforms is that they're uncertain. We know that. <clears throat> we, yeah. we, you know, it seems like no matter what we try to do, certain contributors try to find ways around it. Mm -hmm. And you at one point said you'd like to come up with a better idea, but there, is, there may not be a better idea right now. I mean, a better idea from you, you're saying is to not allow them to not prohibit their contributions to parties. I'm not saying I don't think that's a better idea. I'm not sure what a better idea is. I mean, I'm willing to admit that, but I think this is a step in the right direction. So, um, Brandon and Will, uh, do you have a notion of how much uh, independent expenditure money was spent? But wait, wait a minute. Let's. We're not talking about independent expenditure money here. Okay. I mean, I don't want us to derail our, on that because that is hasn't that isn't the focus of this bill. This bill doesn't do anything okay, so about then, that at all. So then I would use my question to say to Brandon, you have referred to better language that you're not happy with where we are, mm -hmm. and but we we would need, we're wanting to get this bill out mm -hmm. into the House. Do you have better language that you'd like to propose or have us consider? I think simply focusing the scope of the, the bill on political candidates would likely right. so deal just, with yeah, deal with the issues, yeah. eliminating Eliminate political bad. parties, okay. and That's as you as you've done with PACs from from this version of the bill compared to right. last year, it's it's I think just the cleanest way to, to get this through, and and that that would be the only change I think we would propose that would be okay, made. So um, I'd like to hear from Betsy about the, um, she is our attorney. <coughs> And just to remind people that we had what we thought, and it was, and Anthony was actually following, the most progressive and the hardest um, campaign finance law in the country. And it was struck down in 2006. Yeah. It took us from 2006 until when, Betsy, did we pass the first? It was, was it 2014? 2014, so it took us eight years to come to any kind of a an agreement, even among 180 legislators, that we could pass something. So, it just anything we do is is, um, as Anthony said, is uncertain. So, Betsy, would you like to? Good afternoon. For the record, Betsy Andress, Legislative Council here on S47. Um, as you know, S47 is essentially a rerun of S120 that the Senate passed last biennium. When the Senate was considering S120, um, and I think maybe also when the House was considering it after you passed it over there, I created a handout um, providing an overview of campaign finance law. I've emailed it to all of you. It has hyperlinks in it, but Gail has also requested uh, copies be delivered here, so you might see someone show up with okay. some paper copies of it. Okay. But I'm going to just go over some of the provisions in the handout, and maybe it will help you um, to turn back to it later when you're sure. discussing this bill, and it helps explain. When did you send it? Because we and I can look on here. Awesome. Just a few minutes. That's ago. just the appropriate oh. committee, and then we get a little crazy. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> asked me for money. <laughs> Sounds like they're partying in there. It's Betty's birthday. So the handout talks. Awesome. Here it is. Oh, excellent. Okay. So the handout talks about 
how important it is for people to be able to participate in our electoral process because elections are the foundation of our whole government, right? Because we're elect, uh, elect, uh, representative democracy. So when you go onto the first page of the handout, it talks about some of the court quotes on the importance of the ability to participate in campaigns, but it generally describes how there's a distinction between independent expenditures, which is money spent not in coordination with candidates, and those are a person's own speech, and that cannot be limited. Independent expenditures cannot be limited. But contributions are different. Contributions are either money that's given directly to a candidate, PAC, or party, or there's some coordination when the money is spent um, so that it was meant or designed to be coordinated with a candidate to help a candidate or a group of candidates. So first in this handout, if you want to take a look at it, starting at the bottom of page one. It starts talking about independent expenditures and how that's protected First Amendment speech. Hey, Pip, hooray, are those the handouts? No, oh, darn, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Luca. Poor Luca, sorry. I sorry. sent here, what do, you, what do you guys need copies of? Uh, I need you to pick something up from Dave. I'll bring it back here. Thank, thank you, Gail, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'll just keep going because you'll have this info. We, we have it from you. Excellent. Um, so, independent expenditures, so that's money spent to influence an election that's not coordinated with a candidate, that is considered First Amendment protected speech, and a court applies the highest standard review called strict scrutiny. Um, and so far, the courts have said, under the standard review of strict scrutiny, that independent expenditures cannot be limited, regardless of who is speaking, whether it's an individual, or whether it's some non-human entity. Now federal law, we've talked about it before, because federal law does have uh, prohibitions on uh, corporations making contributions similar to what's in your S-47. But in fact, federal law used to not only prohibit corporate contributions, it used to prohibit corporate independent expenditures. It used to require corporations to form a pact in order for them to make independent expenditures. And now I'm on page two of the map at the top. So federal law used to pro prohibit corporations and labor unions from making either independent expenditures or contributions without first establishing a separate segregated fund, which is a PAC. And in a precursor to Citizens United, the US Supreme Court struck down the requirement that certain types of corporations form a PAC in order to make independent expenditures because they said PACs are burdensome alternatives for these people to speak, people corporate people to speak. Later, in Citizens United, the Supreme Court said that PACs are burdensome alternatives, and the fact that any corporation has to create a separate segregated fund pack in order to make independent expenditures creates a prior restraint on their speech. In fact, they had to form a pack before they can speak in regard to an election. And the court said, Political speech does not lose its First Amendment protection simply because its source is a corporation. Corporations and other associations like individuals contribute to the discussion, debate, and dissemination of information and ideas that the First Amendment seeks to foster. That's law. That's Citizens United. It's US Supreme Court law. We have to comply with it. So the effect of that was you cannot require corporations to form PACs in order for them to make independent expenditures. It's too burdensome. Let the corporation speak itself. So then, as a result of that Citizens United case in 2010, there was a DC District Court case called Speech Now that basically said, well, since corporations, uh, since their speech can't be limited, contributions to, to uh, PACs that make only independent expenditures also can't be limited because there's no there's no potential corruption there. If you're only if a group is only going to make independent expenditures, you can't limit contrib contributions to that group, and that is the origin of what we now call super PACs or independent expenditure only PACs, i.e. PACs. And we have a definition of i.e. only PACs in our campaign finance law, and I provided it at the bottom of page two. But. In that case, what we've been talking about so far is speech, independent speech. It's not coordinated with a candidate. Contributions are different. Contributions, the court has said, can be limited. I'm at the top of page three. 
So if you want to turn to page three, that's where we're at right now. We're talking about contributions, and that's what S-47 talks about only. S-47 is only about contributions, not independent expenditures. So the courts have said, by contrast, with a limit on independent expenditures, a limit on the amount any one person or group may contribute to a candidate or a PAC entails only a marginal restriction on their ability to engage in free communication. It's symbolic. And the court has said there's a lesser burden that they have to show, that the state would have to show if they want to regulate contributions. They said the government can regulate contributions to prevent corruption or its appearance. And the contribution limit is closely drawn, it's permissible if it doesn't undermine a material degree of political discussion. Courts have said a contribution limit is unconstitutional unconstitutional if it prohibits candidates and PACs from amassing resources necessary for effective ad advocacy. That's from our own U.S. Supreme Court case, Randall v. Surrell, which challenged our old campaign finance law. And when a court looks at whether contribution limits are too low, they'll look at the infringement on the person's symbolic support, balanced against First Amendment rights not impacted, such as their freedom to discuss candidates and issues. And I've just provided here um, why our 1997 campaign finance law was struck down. But let's move on. I provided the bottom page three, just how our court, our Vermont Supreme Court, has upheld a complete contribution ban. As you know, there's a ban on lobbyist contributions to legislators during the session. And I've also provided a few other links that you might find helpful as you discuss campaign finance generally. On page four, I provided under the section called Contribution Limits a link to NCSL's table on other states' limits on contributions. And that table will show you what other states do in regard to corporate and labor union contribution prohibitions and limits, if you're interested. But S-47 is specifically talking about non-human contributions. So let's turn on page four to section seven. And this is in regard to the government's ability to regu regulate co uh, contributions. So there's a 2003 U.S. Supreme Court case called FEC v. Beaumont, and it upheld the federal law requirement for these issue advocacy nonprofits to form a PAC in order for them to make a contribution. And the court stated in part that contributions enjoy the benefits of state laws such as limited liability, perpetual life and favorable treatment of the accumulation and distribution of assets, which present the potential for distorting the political process. And specifically, the court said that congressional judgment in the area of corporate contributions warrants considerable deference and reflects a permissible assessment of the dangers posed by corporations to the electoral process. And the court said there is still a hard line between speech and association, and the latter may be limited. So after Citizens United, there was a Second Circuit Court case, that's our Federal Court, court of Appeals at, in which Vermont is a part of. It was called Ogden v. Parks. It discussed that Beaumont is still good law in its application to contributions and reiterated that Citizens United only applies to corporate independent expenditures, still maintaining that line between the inability for government to regulate corporate pure speech and the ability to regulate corporate contributions. At the bottom of page four, um, uh, Connecticut was discussed, and I am familiar with the Green Party case. I'll go back and look to it, but I believe that the Green Party case was about prohibiting lobbyists or contractors to make contributions. I don't believe it specifically addressed corporations, but I'm happy to go back and reread that case I don't know how many times I've read it, but I will go back and I will review that case and I can get back to you on it. But for example, I provided at the bottom of page four what Connecticut actually does. And if you 
follow that link to the Je Connecticut General Statutes, it will take you to their prohibitions on corporations making contributions in the state of Connecticut. In fact, Connecticut requires corporations to establish PACs, and I've also provided here the information that they go a step further and say a business entity is prohibited from, make, from establishing more than one PAC. Is it the talked about here, remember? Yeah. yeah um, could a corporation just go out and start making all these PACs yeah. so they can make multiple contributions? Well, Connecticut address, addresses that oh, in their law. Good, that's saying good. business entity cannot establish yeah, more that, than one PAC. Not to interrupt your train of thought, but that, as far as you know, has not been challenged. As far as I know, yes, at this point. That's a, that's a good addition. At the top of page five, um, I provided what federal law currently provides for prohibitions on corporate contributions and labor union contributions. So under federal law, corporations and labor unions are prohibited from making contributions in federal elections. They are prohibited. If they want to make a contribution, a corporation or a labor union can establish a separate segregated fund for political purposes. A separate segregated fund is a PAC and they actually place limits on how they can solicit funds to those PACs. Um, they're only able to solicit funds from individuals associated with a corporation or a labor union. For example, their stockholders or members in their families and other specified individuals. Um, a separate segregated fund is a PAC, so big picture. Corporations aren't under federal law, aren't even allowed to make a contribution to a PAC like S47 would but corporations can establish one of these PACs using their own funds to at least get it started, not to make a actual contribution to it. Um, so, anyway, so, so under S47, a corporation could give a PAC to any, to give money to any PAC it wants under what you, the federal law. They have to establish their own PAC. Correct, yeah. So they can't, a corporation can establish only one PAC they can't establish more than one pack, but could they give? Could their could they give to more than one pack? I mean, <clears throat> they they establish one pack, mm -hmm. and then their their neighbor down the street establishes a pack because they they agree with each other, and so they contribute back and forth. Oh, but under federal, it could only be their individuals associated with them anyway, so it isn't the corporation giving, right? So under federal law, they're overall prohibited from making any contributions. Corporations, the corporation labor itself, yeah. correct. But they can establish these yeah. their own yeah. PACs. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Whereas under S forty seven, it's a little looser in that a corporation could still be considered a single source and give a direct contribution to a PAC, but it would have to be under your current PAC limits. Right. The contribution limits. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, also, just to note, under federal law, um, the name of a corporate or labor union separate segregated fund has to include the name of its connected organization, just so you know um, if it's uh, Brian's it. Corporation, it would have to be named Brian's Corporation Path or something similar. For my you couldn't have Texas, Vermonters for Happy Families. Correct. Correct. All right, so that's the big picture of the lay of a land right now under federal law and some examples from other states on what is permissible. Big picture, there, it is permissible to put uh, restrictions on the ability of corporations to make contributions. Um, specifically, can I guarantee that S-47 would be upheld? Absolutely not. I'm an attorney in the legislative branch. Only the judicial branch can render or adjudicate constitutional decisions, um, but I'm just telling you what I'm aware of for the current state of the law. But I can never make a guarantee whether this would be upheld. And the judiciary won't weigh in. And they won't weigh in, because right. we don't they have advisors. They've told us that many times. Right. So uh, I have other um, information in here, but we've just reviewed what's really um, at the heart of S-47. Um, so what else can I tell you, Madam Chair? Um, well, since you count the shortest, <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions for Betsy? No, I just I don't just, think I have any particular questions. I mean, I want us to talk more about the bill in general, but I don't have questions. Okay. No, I I, I think that your te testimony, Betsy Ann, raises some interesting things we might consider adding to this bill. 
like limiting how many uh, uh, businesses can, how many packs a business could form. It's an interesting thought. And to be clear, I'll do this, I know we've said this before, but we get confused sometimes when talking about it amongst ourselves. Under the, under the bill proposal, corporations could only give money to PACs. Correct. Not to parties and not to people. That's correct. And candidates. Right, I said people, yeah. And candidates. And she's going to double check with that the Green Party, the green party uh, case to see if we might consider uh, taking out the, as a result. If we were worried about a challenge, taking also, out the contribution to a party. We were talking about this yesterday when you weren't here, Betsy, just to be clear that this has no impact on somebody running for Congress. That's right, because federal law controls campaign right. finance on the federal level. Yeah. Thank you, yeah, that was yeah. good. Corporations are currently prohibited from contributing directly at the federal level, and, 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 uh, and so a candidate for Congress cannot accept a federal uh, contribution from a corporation. Unless they happen to be an LLC that's incorporated on Friday and they wear blue socks instead of red. There you go. <laughs> the, the, the guidelines for the, it, I mean, I've said before, they're 134 pages long because I looked them up when we were doing this before. So I would like us to consider the prohibition on business entities establishing more than one pack. Yeah. We use those words necessarily. But I would like to consider, because the, the one criticism, no, well, not the one, but the, no, did you want that post? No, actually, it's annoying, but it's sunlight. It's just such a <laughs> rare thing. Dan, would you want to give a little bit of compromise? Okay, so <laughs> it's wrecking. Okay. So, anyway, anyway. anyway. Well, one of the Talk criticisms or concerns we hear often with this kind of bill is that, well, the corporations just go out and start 10 packs. So we could prohibit them from doing that. By saying that they shall do no more than one pack. And it would, it would have to apply to not just corporations, in my mind. It would have to apply to anybody that wasn't an individual. I mean, it would have to apply to labor unions and everybody. So you couldn't have the VSEA have three PACs or um, the AFL-CIO have three different PACs. It would be any entity that was not an individual. Well, yeah. how, does, how does what's in here now relate to unions? Well, they can't give to they, individuals. They qualify as corporations. They're, they're not an individual. It right. doesn't. So they have the same rule that applies to corporations. Correct. Because yeah. Correct. this does not ban corporations from giving. It just says that only individuals and PACs and parties can give to candidates and parties. That's all it says. It doesn't say a word about corporations at all. Well, but it does have an effect. Well, well that, yes, but I'm saying that it doesn't, it, it doesn't mention corporations. So it isn't banning corporate donations. It's, it's limiting. If well, you it's happen, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. If you happen to be a corporation, you can still give to a PAC. Yes. Because you you're in. You're in PAC. Because oh, you're an entity. You're right. a, a single source. Yeah. Yeah. But, yes. But we do. Uh, so do we, um, we had thought we might vote on this today, but do we want to put it off and have more discussion on um, whether we want to address the issue of the number of whether or not corporation or entities can only form one pack of their own and can they donate to other packs? I don't know if we can limit, that. but we need a little more research on that. And there was one other idea that came up the Green Party. Well, well yeah, I'd just she's like gonna, to hear more about yeah. the Green Party. And just to, to clarify, that, and, and Betsy can, can check on this for you, the, that, that case does not deal with corporate contributions specifically, but it looks at a ban between lobbyists and contractors, and the, the law as it was passed was between candidates and political parties. The ban between yeah. the contributors and the, the candidates was upheld political parties were struck down. Right. And it's a similar principle where, again, the degree of separation, you, you can make the case that that somebody accepting a corporate contribution could be influenced by that contributor, and that may affect their decision-making ability or, or how they may vote. Political parties don't 
don't craft legislation. We don't we don't write laws. We. But I'm I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm yeah. just going to say that yeah. the I'm, you're not at the table. Yeah. And the discussion that happens is, I mean, quite testified. And we generally, until we're doing markup and we ask people for their comments on a particular area, we don't um, have other people. Shut up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. No, we don't use shut up. He did. Um, so what what would you like to do, committee? Do you want to put this off until next week and get more information and see is there a step farther that we can take and what would that mean? And um, I think if we could put it off, maybe to. to <coughs> Sorry, it's up to Betsy, but if we can get back to us by Tuesday, I, mean, I wouldn't mind putting it off at least until Tuesday. I don't want to put it off. There's no reason to put it off a long time. I think most of us know how we're going to vote and how it's going to turn out. But I would think okay. if we could just. Well, Chris is missing right now, yeah. so right. I would love to have Chris be able to. We have, we have it potentially on here for Tuesday afternoon at. Um, and we put it on there because we're dealing with a lot of things that. Um, affect the Secretary of State on Tuesday. We're going to look at um, the no OPR notaries issue. We're going to uh, review kind of miscellaneous elections issues that have come up. The, the bill isn't completely drafted yet because um, some, somebody, uh, <laughs> asked, somebody asked for too many bills to be drafted. <coughs> so they're, <laughs> and, um, but we'll just have a list of, we can start talking about the list of um, suggestions. And then we're going to talk about, um, we're going to have a walkthrough of S78, which is the relating to lobbying uh, reporting dates. And just for and, point of information, on Tuesday, I'm going to be down the hall between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. Or so. Okay. Well, we'll the, we'll take this up after. Okay. That. I just, so, I don't okay. Want us to vote. Okay. No. And, and as you know, I've, I'll probably be here about two thirty. Right. Okay. Oh, that's right. And I've been asked to go across the hall at one. Huh? The Senate institutions. Well, does somebody want to sit in these chairs <laughs> at one thirty with me? I'll be here by one thirty. Okay. All right. Okay. So we'll do that. If anybody has any other ideas that they might want to attach to this bill. Thank you, Dan. We're sorry that we, but you might be happier in the end. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So that. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we have to do with this afternoon. So I, I apologize for being late here. Are you artificial intelligence? I'm artificial. Yes. <laughs> and intelligent? I don't know about that. That's up for debate. No, we think you are. Or I do, anyway. Oh, I think you should. That's a comment about you, not me. <laughs> so I just want to, before we get started, I just want to point out the, um, the blackboard here. <laughs> the bottom part. Everybody's seen the top. Our own Senator Palmer was inducted into the Broadcasters Hall of Fame and the Principals Referee Hall of Fame. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Two different Halls of Fame mm -hmm. at the same time? Well, That's one was... Uh, Double Hall of Famer. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you should be wearing <laughs> orange stripes today. <laughs> I'll be wearing it all weekend. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get hit last night? Yes. No. Not last night. On Wednesday. Recently. Yeah, it's just beginning to show. It's yeah. interesting it didn't show so much yesterday. Yeah. Oh, he took the guy out of the game. Gosh, well, it wasn't his fault. I should have got out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so are you um, Brian? Yes. Oh, good. Come on up. Enjoy the suit. Yes, you with the hot seat. All right. So I take it you have not been to testify to the committee before, uh, but... Never. Okay, so we'll... I'll just tell you the way we do this kind of thing. Everything is recorded, um, so you probably don't want to say anything you wouldn't want your mom to hear if she happens to ask for the CD. Um, and it's a publicly available because these are open meetings are open, and so for people who can't come here, we record it. We'll introduce yeah. ourselves, and uh, then you can take it away and just identify yourself for the record. So, Anthony. I'm Anthony Clean. I represent Washington. 
I'm Brian, Jeff. oh sorry. Go ahead. Brian Collamore from the Rutland District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Jeanette White, Wyndham District. And our chair. And, yeah. and um, we have a sick member who's left rather than infect you from Addison County. <laughs> so um, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Brian Bresland. Um, uh, I, I asked to, uh, I, as you're aware, I asked you um, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The reason we're sitting down here um, preliminarily is um, requesting additional meetings for the uh, task force. Uh, part, of the, part of the act was, um, I think, 10 meetings total. Mm -hmm. um, I was told that Ryan, uh, Brian Cena, who was a representative, mm -hmm. um, that at the time, one at one point in time, the, uh, the 10 meetings were uh, associated with compensation, and now there's no compensation um, for the act. So I was wondering, if, in that regard, if we could um, amend the act to uh, have additional meetings. So can I, I need a little bit of background. Yes. So you you you, you work for the committee. Yes. Well, who so do you work for? You're, you're, oh, um, yeah, like sorry. Do you have some context? Sorry. Uh, I work for a pr uh, private consulting uh, firm, Dubois and King. I was selected as part of the task force um, from the Vermont Society of Engineers. For the artificial intelligence Yes, uh, task. of the 14-member group. Right, and it was Brian and Sheena's uh, 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 bill last year. Yeah, so what are you supposed to be doing? We are supposed to be studying artificial intelligence uh, and then providing the Senate our, and our the state, state well, um, with ultimately a report on recommendations um, that the state could implement um, with our for artificial intelligence. I'm sure I'm missing a couple, couple sure, tidbits here and there, there, but that's generally what we're, we're tasked with doing. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, just one more curious thing. I mean, what, how did you come about doing this? What do you do that has to do with artificial? I'm really a layman in terms of okay. artificial intelligence. Uh, again, one of the Part of the act was to uh, get a task force member um, from the Vermont Society of Engineers. I'm a civil engineer. Um, I really do not deal with artificial intelligence on a daily basis, and it's this, this whole process, I guess, is new, new to me, and um, it's a learning experience. So that's just like all the rest of us here. We deal with a whole lot of issues that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about. I think one of the things that we really wanted to know was how how we often let technology get ahead of us yeah. in and then and then we try to catch up by writing policies and procedures and stuff to, to try to catch up and we're often so far behind that we it controls us rather than we controlling it. And one of the goals I think was to see how how was there a role for the state in regulating in any way and, and, and also applying to our own procedures. So I think that, that was the, the artificial intelligence community out there is off and running. They're doing whatever they're doing, but how, how does it relate to the state and how can we, Brian? So you've already had 10 meetings? We have, we've had five meetings. Oh, still. five, okay. Um, with the five remaining, we're trying to figure out how to um, engage the public and um, also organize a final report. And all 14 have been at each meeting? Uh, no, I, at, at least the majority are a quorum, at least seven. More likely 10, okay. 10, 10, 12. And the time limit that we gave you was a year? I believe it may be nine months. I think we started around so You still have five meetings left, sort of? One per, one per month or so. Okay. Or so. Um, I believe the uh, final report is due in June. Um, that is another uh, request that the task force is asking for would be a, an extension to that. So uh, I'd like to know when you want the extension to and what progress have you made to date? Okay. Uh, we will, The task force was thinking about September. So instead of nine months, task force being together would be a year. Um, you have an interim report, did you? Uh, yes, that's that's due on the fifteenth. I, I sent it to Gail. Okay. Did you bring her? Um, yes, I did. Okay. That um, this this is not 
uh, finalized? Well, we know that. Okay. But we actually, just for your information, when you do finalize the report and do it, we like reports that look like that instead of ones with glossy covers that cost a lot to produce. Okay. Uh, would you like to change the Okay. Uh, Of the yes. Council, Chris, so do you far? want to join? Would it be helpful if the two of you, as I, co-chairs, I think he he will cover it okay. perfectly well. But if there's a question, I'm okay. You're there. I sit there enough, don't I? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, and there's been five meetings so far. Uh, one of the the first initial meeting really we didn't we didn't do too much. Just a meet and greet, and how are we um, going to? Uh, provide the, the product that the, the state requires. Um, at the first meeting, uh, Chris and I were selected as co-chairs. Um, from there, the second meeting um, was scheduled. Um, that's when we started really formulating who we're gonna, how, how we're gonna, how, who, what, why, where, when, how, um, so to speak. Um, we started looking at um, Risks, opportunities, liabilities, um, things of that nature. Um, one of the, I believe, one of the uh, in the in the act was uh, trying to see um, speak with different industries uh, across industry AI across uh, uh, the entire industries of Vermont. Uh, in that regard, we tried um, summarizing different industries in Vermont, and um, from there we we decided we were going to try to speak to. Um, one one speaker in each industry. Um, from there, um, it would be the last three meetings, and um, we've from those in each of those three meetings, we've tried to categorize industries that are similar in nature. Um, for example, medical, healthcare, and then insurance, um, technology, manufacturing, construction, labor. As, um, industries. So I believe at the third meeting, um, we did, we looked at uh, we, brought, we asked speakers from the agricultural and natural resources community. Um, mo most most uh, presenters were from uh, UVM. Uh, they talked up again. They talked about you know different aspects of um, artificial intelligence in in their field. Uh, the fourth meeting was held in December. Um, that was on fourteenth, uh, I believe, fourteenth of December. Uh, that meeting was on transportation and manufacturing, construction, and labor. Um, speakers were from the consulting industry uh, of engineering. Um, one of the task force members, I believe, spoke. Um, Joe Sigali uh, from the artificial uh, for a, from the autonomous vehicle uh, aspect. Um, uh, from the construction industry, um, a contractor um, from the you know, dealing with roads, roads, bridges. That that uh, that type of construction was brought in. Um, and I know this. He spoke on. Uh, his personal use of artificial intelligence. Um, and then finally, there was a fifth meeting um, on January 18th where we spoke to uh, the healthcare industry and um, medical devices industry. Um, most people were from UVM, but I believe there was a Southwestern um, Regional Medical Center um, speaker as well. Um, and again, talking about you know the 
the, the lack of artificial artificial intelligence in their industry or what they're doing with doing with artificial intelligence currently, and um, that yeah. So that has been the five meetings thus far. Uh, we're we're planning on the next few meetings uh, to uh, engage the public, get their opinion and input on on the matter of artificial intelligence, and just see what their input is. Um, and then I guess the you know these last five remaining uh, meetings would be um, trying to provide the state with uh, the final report. So can you give us, just tell us stories of some of the ways we're most successfully seeing artificial intelligence applied in Vermont, because we see it in our daily lives and we don't all recognize it. Okay, I can give examples. And, and then I guess my question is, it sounds like you're asking us to exempt the public hearings from being included as part of your meetings. And to me, that's what you're, oh, it sounds like you're asking, is that you'd like to have five remaining meetings, but maybe independent of the public meetings. Uh, I, I guess, yes. That, 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 the that's public meetings, you're just listening, you're not. I want Jill's here, too, she's on the test. Uh, I, I guess, yes. Oh, I have a different view than you do, Jill Sharpenau, of uh, Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. As I understand it, we have two, we have, we're doing judicial, and Criminal Justice so next meeting, the 22nd, and then we'll be doing retail, how it impacts retail workers. Uh, we also want to do a series of meetings that goes out to the public right. and hold public forums, right. but we don't feel we can get that done by right. June 30th, and that's the reason right. for the extension. Uh, yeah, well, we can, we'll talk, but, but, sure. some, but I'd love to, yeah, just hear, hear uh, about how you have experienced AI applied, so give us a notion of how it's successfully been. Okay, uh, I can give us several examples, from, again, from the speakers that I've heard of. Um, uh, the construction industry, um, we heard from uh, ECI. Um, they are, they actually have a labor shortage, or they, they cannot find the amount of um, staff to fulfill the job, their job requirements, so they are actually using. Um, they they consider it artificial intelligence software programs to better um, place resources, staff members, machinery, equipment across varying jobs across the state. Um, uh, Joe 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 Sigali. Um, in the terms of transportation, spoke on um, autonomous vehicles. What's what's there currently, and then what's going, um, what's going to happen in the future. Um, at that same meeting, um, I, for, I forget the guy, I forget the gentleman's name, but he um, he actually drove drove uh, to this to the presentation in a Tesla, and uh, basically said all he had to do was hold on to the steering wheel, and the car drove for him. Um, it was able to. Uh, detect the center line and white edge lines of the road. Um, Joe, Joe, Joe mentioned uh, it's, it could be anywhere from you know ten years to you know forty years before we're starting to see autonomous vehicles, but that's open up to, open to interpretation. Um, at the agricultural and natural resources um, uh, meeting. I forget the gentleman's name, but he ran a, a dairy farm or dairy uh, product, uh, uh, dairy product for milking cows. He sells th this uh, machine that milks cows on its own. And, I, I seen that. Oh, okay, and uh, it's completely hands off, and the the the, uh, the machine knows when to let cows in or out to maximize milking. Basically, and it can it's basically a, it learns about their their feed patterns and um, other aspects of you know the cow's nutrition and how many times a day does it milk the cow or how many times will it let it into the par the parlor basically. Um, so uh, that was that was kind of interesting. Um, for the uh, medical, healthcare, and insurance, um, we were dealing with. Uh, Two, two uh, presenters spoke on uh, cancer treatments or detecting cancer cells. Artificial, you know, computer software programs are able to, um, instead of having the human eye look at the cells, 
have a computer um, look at the cells and look for abnormalities and um, uh, you know, irregularities in the cells to detect cancer. Um, we have artificial intelligence that's more intelligent than human intelligence. Well, maybe not. They're just. One, don't of, know. one of the one of the at topics during that same discussion was the liability of a computer recognizing uh, a cancer versus a second opinion of the, right. of, of the of the per, of a doctor or you know the. What, what is the liability associated with taking the computer's um, interpretation versus a, you know, a person's? So I wanted to add, I'll be, uh, also heard from a speaker who did a study, I believe, at Harvard about using Instagram to detect people who might have PTSD and or depression, that there is an ability from how they present themselves to discover whether they might need treatment, and that, that was an application he was very interested in mm -hmm. uh, helping people. We also heard from a person from the Southwest Medical Center who started just using, I think it's like a Windows program from Microsoft, and gathering information and streamlining their some of their processes in the hospital himself, just and finding how well it worked and how the uh, the program could detect who was entering the data just by you know their their choice of words, so on and so forth. So people are out there, you know, playing around, using the stuff themselves without necessarily a, you know a big program behind them. And the fellow who drove in the to the meeting in the uh, Tesla is also the head person at Global Foundries for developing artificial intelligence. It's very uh, a lot of discussion about. How does it apply, and how do we use it? I've heard just with the cars, just as an aside, I've heard, I forget from who, but somebody who knew what they were talking about, that the autonomous vehicles are going to have a harder time navigating dirt roads. That's true. Yes, because they use the lines. When there's snow, when there's a lot of snow, they're not going to know where to go. The lines, they use the lines painted on the road. Right, because yeah. anytime time the lines are obscured, they have difficult time. There are a lot of lines. It's Chris is going to love this one. I, it's a, I heard this the other day, how you can tell a drunk driver in Vermont. Yes. <laughs> they drive pretty slow and straight because they don't want people to think they're weaving. They hit every potholder. The <laughs> non-drunk driver weaves in and out to avoid the potholders. Do you remember that? Um, so I, I, I don't want to... Um, I, I want to keep hearing a little more about this, but... I'm going to just throw out a suggestion right now for us to consider so that you don't have to wonder if we're going to ever address your requests. Um, that we suggest giving you till January of 2020, that would be a year from now, to come up with a report that we give you um, maybe five or six more meetings. You, would, you wouldn't be able to have more than, because you have five left anyway, right? So between now and next January, you wouldn't be able to, and that you not, um, that the that if you hold like four public hearings, that they not count right. as your meetings, right? Because so you would have you would in effect have like five more meetings left, and then another um, four or five meetings, because so, you're going to have two. The way I look heard you say you're going to have two more fact-finding meetings I mean, yeah. purely talking to people and then you're going to have public hearings and then you're going to need I would think maybe four meetings to start talking about how how do we how does this impact the state is there any role for the state to play here not not only how can we use it in our own processes but is there is there any segment of this that should be regulated? How do, how are we as a state going to respond to it? That's just going to be my my suggestion for okay. right now and you can, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to, us to get there before 
I, yeah. I would support right. that. And exempt like three public meetings. Yeah, or something. Whatever you were thinking. Yeah, and I'm fine with that. I'm just trying to get a handle. So if there's 14, you all get per diems and mileage for each meeting? No, no. Or you don't? We get yeah. squat. We just come because we're <laughs> Some of us are staying squat. Yeah. Okay. Some of us are not. So right. we're not, we're not talking about uh, thousands, thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. There's no, no. Money. There's just, um, Brian, uh, China is the only legislator that, that would cost us money. Everybody else would pay. I, 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 I'd like to mention, I believe uh, Kayla is um, compensated for her time. Oh, oh. and Kayla. And she's not her first, level you know. of compensation, it will break us. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. Kayla is your hidden secret weapon. Do you always meet at the same spot? <laughs> so far. Yeah. At, yeah. Yes, at National Life, I believe the building, uh, the room numbers have changed. But okay. National we Life. We plan to, when we go public, to actually go around the state. Good. Yeah. Good. For your We'd love to have yeah. you in Hunter County. I, I second the chair's motion then. I think it's great. Yeah. I, I would agree just to figure out whether it's three or four public hearings and then five right. meetings in addition. Good. Make a suggestion. <coughs> is there any reason we would limit the number of public hearing public no. meetings? I don't care. You can have twenty of them. That's my time. point. So really, we're talking about the number of meetings that we can have under the under your authority or the authority of the. the yeah. I mean, I, I mean, if you want to have the more public meetings we have, the better, as far as right. Concerned. Yeah, but we want to make sure you still have enough substantive time to talk and yeah, and make right. You know, so the that, that's what I'm saying. In addition to the meetings, you if we don't limit, if we only limit or yeah. expand the limit on our the actual meetings, the public meetings are just gravy. Yeah, yeah, but they aren't always just gravy. They're often yeah. included in our. But we're the, not. We're excluding public meetings. I, from I know that was my idea. I didn't like it. I think it's a good idea. I. I for once, I'm with you. I'm with you all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. She's so, mad at me now. Look. I'm not mad. I'm charmed. Because oh. so, I'm not sure why we would want to report in June anyway when we're not around. Right. Well, that, so yeah. if we put it till January 15th or something like that, um, then there's time for us to react to the recommendations and for committees of jurisdiction to start looking at it, does trans agency of transportation, I mean Department of Transportation, what a committee of transportation, do they have a role in here? <coughs> Are they going to start having different regulations for uh, hmm. self-driven cars or whatever you call them? So th that'll give us a chance to, yeah. The, the one thought I have actually is it, we have a much um, shorter time frame next year for our bill introduction. Yeah. And well, we're changing that. Well, we haven't yet. <laughs> so, I mean, we may change it, but uh, at the moment, the Senate has an earlier deadline, and I believe it's in December. Yes. So, one thought might be that this report be due to set in December. December, if we wanted to affect that, or we could do a committee bill any time. Right? No, we can't. We can't do a committee bill any time, but we're changing that. Committee bills are in the Senate have the same deadlines as regular as other bills. But we are, the Rules Committee was going to take that up today, but we went too long on the floor because too many people had to Okay. Speak. But in lieu of that, do you want to keep your January proposal? Yes. Okay. I, I would keep the January 15th proposed deadline, and we'll get special permission to introduce bills if we need to. So just so I'm clear about this conversation, okay. <laughs> complete, we can complete the report by January 15th, 2020. Public meetings will be excluded from right. counting as everything. Meeting count. Okay, and then our general meetings. There's five remaining. Okay, you can and wait. We'll add ten. We'll add, I mean, we'll, we'll add, add five. five. So okay. you have ten remaining. Okay. Right. So I don't want to necessarily prolong this, but it's very fascinating to me. Um, so you had some folks come in, Brian and Jill and Chris. Feel free to add. And they are telling you about the ways in which their particular piece of industry or whatever they do. Are, are getting affected by this. Did anyone have like bad stuff to say? Like we read somewhere, I don't know where it was, that one of the cars that supposedly could take care of itself ran over somebody in a crosswalk. There's been one death, as I understand yeah. it. Have Did anyone have any negative sort of things to say? I, I guess speaking in broad generalities, there's a lot of good things, there's a lot of bad things with what's coming, um, one of which is perhaps labor reduction. Um, so, uh, yeah. Some some of what you know some of the some of these software programs could take away jobs by you know 
what 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 the the job the current person is doing sure. and what is capable of this, mm -hmm. these programs. Um, some of them may be good. I mean, I'm not sure a farmer really loves milking. I mean, some of them do probably, well, but it's, but it's, some, some it's a chore it's a, at some level. But right, some of them think it's, it's a good thing yeah. in some regards. We saw one at the farm show. Yeah. If you went by it, it was... I've seen, a film. I've seen yeah. a film of it. Well, we had milking machines, but those are different. You had to slap them on and you had to... Yeah, this one does it, I think, by itself. It does yeah. it yeah, all by itself. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so there are challenges. On the other hand, there are retail oh. stores now that don't have any retail clerks. That's exactly right. And then you go to some fast food places and you yep. order at a kiosk. Right. So they've eliminated at least one position. Right? Yep. Yeah. On the other hand, all those programs had to be created That's by right. a human being. And so where one job is taken away, often several are created. Innovation marches on. And sadly, had they had this task force in 1890, they would have been facing the same industrial revolution as, you know, in the 1840s, 50s, 60s. I mean, it, things evolve, and I think our getting, a, trying to get a handle on how it's going to evolve, and what are the things we need to address to help our workforce deal with it and be prepared for it is, in fact, what why this is so valuable for us. I don't disagree. And, and not just our workforce, but our, I, I keep thinking that are, are there things out there that we need to create new regulations around? Yes. That yes. I, I, and I have no idea, because to be quite honest with you, this is so far above my head that when Brian came in and suggested this artificial task force, um, artificial intelligence task force, um, I thought he was talking about replacing the legislature. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I, I just, this is not, this is not my area at all. So I, I really need to have the, the knowledge that you gain here put into into specific steps that I know how to, I know how to um, implement if they, if they need to be, so. I was say, we've, already, we've already discussed in, in the last several meetings about you know, what kind of recommendations mm -hmm. we could offer. Um, I don't want to, I guess, no. state anything at this time, but we've, we've already been discussing about what could be done, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, again, we would have, you know, I think that would come in the Final report. Yeah, I think I have no problems with it. Extending. I think it's exciting. Yeah. Definitely interesting. Do you know uh, Ben McKinney? Yes. He used to work for my company, Boy and King. How, yeah. do you, how do you know him? I am a good friend of his mother's, and I, his mother, Chris Hart, is my boss in my other life. <laughs> And so I kind of knew him when he was a little kid, but yeah. I'm sure he, he I, I, yeah, again, I know him, but he, he actually isn't the one who spoke, uh, Joey Appleton spoke. Yeah, I just, you said you were from the Boy and King. Yep. And I, yep. Yep. Anything else? No, no. Sounds like you're doing good work. Yeah, thank you. Right. And thanks for coming. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to, one final thing I wanted to ask was, uh, should 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 this task force be keeping? Uh, obviously, Brian Cena is in the on the task force. He's you know being aware. Should should the task force be corresponding with this this committee with, for any regard about just on a regular basis or? No, I think if if you have questions, if questions come up about where you might go or you think you need some kind of direction from us, but I think you're you're a we you. The people that are on that task force are the people that we thought were entrusted to, to deal with this issue. So I don't think that's us. So, and if if um, Brian, if there's something that he feels needs some kind of attention, I'm sure he'll bring it to us. Okay. So the, who drafted the original? Did Betsy draft the original? No, I think it was Becky Wasserman. Because we have to not, we have to remember now to do this. Yeah. We have to draft the bill or do something to extend it. Yeah, we will. And it was, I don't remember if it was Becky or, um, do you know if it was Becky or yeah. Maria? I don't Maybe. know. I can't, but I'll look it up. Yeah. I, I, my guess is that. Mm, it was late I, or Helena, maybe. I was thinking Helena. Okay. Well, we'll we will have a, a bill drafted about this.
Maybe we could add it to the boards and commissions bill so we don't have to put a separate bill. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks. Wasn't too bad, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but anytime you have any questions or anything, feel yeah. free to contact us or and Chris is here almost every day, or, or, so like Gail or yeah, okay. Gail or any okay. of us. Yeah. Okay. Or yeah. Kayla. We told him this was the scariest committee to testify. <laughs> Did he tell you that? <laughs> oh my God. I mixed yeah. it up, obviously. Yeah. I think I'm warning you, but you might be a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought we were so scary. Not at all. <laughs> Have a nice yeah. people. Thank you. you too. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Really great. Sure. Sure. I'll let my brother know. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. No, they were a year. I've been in the VAB hall of the Mon Association for over a year. That's what I thought. Last December. And then you and Jim? Jim Connors. Yeah, we went in. Thank you. Well, I'll be meet you, Brian. Hey, Take care. Thanks, Kayla. Okay. I love that Kayla is as proud of this work and she's as excited about this work. Oh, really? Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah, she came here. She's snapping the committee. She's been very engaged. I um, must admit that it is so far beyond. Can you turn the camera off for right now? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> what we have to do with this afternoon. So I, I apologize for being late here. Are you artificial intelligence? I'm artificial, yes. <laughs> and intelligent? I don't know about that. That's not for debate. No, we think you are. Or I do, anyway. Oh, I think so. That's a comment about you, not me. <laughs> so I just want to, before we get started, I just want to point out the um, the blackboard here. <laughs> the bottom part. Everybody's seen the top. Our own Senator Palmer was inducted into the Broadcasters Hall of Fame and the Principals Referee Hall of Fame. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Two different Halls of Fame mm -hmm. at the same time? Well, That's one was uh, double Hall of Famer. Yeah. Last wow. year. Mm -hmm. You should be wearing okay. orange stripes today. <laughs> I'll be wearing it all weekend. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get hit last night? Yes. No. <laughs> Not last night. On Wednesday. Recently. Yeah, it's just beginning to show. It's yeah. interesting. It didn't well, show so much yesterday. Oh, you took the guy out of the game. Gosh, well, it wasn't his fault. I should have got out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Are you um, Brian? Yes. Oh, good. Come on up and join us. Yes, you're the hot seat. All right. So I take it you have not been to testify to the committee before? Uh, but never. OK, so we'll, I'll just tell you the way we do this kind of Everything is recorded. Um, so you probably don't want to say anything you wouldn't want your mom to hear if she happens to ask for the CD. Um, and it's a publicly available because these are open meetings are open, and so for people who can't come here, we record it. We'll introduce yeah. ourselves, and uh, then you can take it away and just identify yourself for the record. So, Anthony. I'm Anthony Clay, and I represent Washington. I'm Brian. Jeff. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Brian Collamore from the Rutland District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Jeanette White, Wyndham District. And our chair. And, yeah. And um, we have a sick member who's left rather than infect you from Addison County. <laughs> so um, take it away. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Brian Bresland, um, uh, I, I asked to, uh, I, as you're aware, I asked you um, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. The reason we're sitting down here um, preliminarily is um, requesting additional meetings for the uh, task force. Uh, part of the part of the act was um, I think 10 meetings total um, I was told that Brian, uh, Brian Cena who was a representative um, that at the time one at one point in time the, uh, the 10 meetings were uh, associated with compensation and now there's no compensation um, for the act so I was wondering if in that regard if we could um, amend the act to uh, have additional meetings. So can I, I need a little bit of background. Yes. So you you you, you work for the committee. Yes. Well, who so do you work for? You're, you're, oh, um, yeah, like to sorry. Do you have some context? Sorry. 
Uh, I work for a, pro a private consulting uh, firm, Dubois and King. I was selected as part of the task force um, from the Vermont Society of Engineers. For the artificial intelligence Yes, uh, of the 14-member group. Right, and it was Brian and Sheena's uh, 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 bill last year. Yeah, so what are you supposed to be doing? We are supposed to be studying artificial intelligence uh, and then providing the Senate our, and our the state, state well, um, with ultimately a report on recommendations um, that the state could implement um, with our for artificial intelligence. I'm sure I'm missing a couple, couple sure, tid tidbits here and there, but that's generally what we're, we're tasked with doing. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, it's just one more curious thing. I mean, what, how did you come about doing this? What do you do that has to do with artificial? I'm really a layman in terms of okay. artificial intelligence. Uh, again, one of the Part of the act was to uh, get a task force member um, from the Vermont Society of Engineers. I'm a civil engineer. Um, I really do not deal with artificial intelligence on a daily basis, and it's this, this whole process, I guess, is new, new to me, and um, it's a learning experience. So that's just like all the rest of us here. We deal with a whole lot of issues that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about. I think one of the things that we really wanted to know was how how we often let technology get ahead of us yeah. in and then and then we try to catch up by writing policies and procedures and stuff to, to try to catch up and we're often so far behind that we it controls us rather than we controlling it. And one of the goals I think was to see how how was there a role for the state in regulating in any way and, and, and also applying to our own procedures. So I think that, that was the, the artificial intelligence community out there is off and running. They're doing whatever they're doing, but how, how does it relate to the state and how can we, Brian? So you've already had 10 meetings? We have, we've had five meetings. Oh, today. five, okay. Um, with the five remaining, we're trying to figure out how to um, engage the public and um, also organize a final report. And all 14 have been at each meeting? Uh, no, I, at, at least the majority are a quorum, about seven, more likely 10, okay. 10, 10, 12. And the time limit that we gave you was a year? I believe it may be nine months. I think we started around so You still have five meetings left, sort of? One per, one per month or so. Okay. Or so. Um, I believe the uh, final report is due in June. Um, that is another uh, request that the task force is asking for would be a, an extension to that. So uh, I'd like to know when you want the extension to and what progress have you made to date? Okay. Uh, we will, The task force was thinking about September. So instead of nine months, task force being together would be a year. Um, you have an interim report, did you? Uh, yes, that's that's due on the fifteenth. I, I sent it to Gail. Okay. Did you um, bring her? Yes, I did. Okay. That um, great. This okay. this is not f uh, finalized. Well, we know that. Okay. But we actually, just for your information, when you do finalize the report and do it, we like reports that look like that instead of ones with glossy covers that <laughs> cost a lot to produce. Okay. Uh, would you like to check? Or, And Yes. Yeah, so Chris, do you so want to join? Would it be helpful if the two of you, as co-chairs, I think he he will cover it okay. perfectly well. But if there's a question, I'm okay. You're there. I sit there enough, don't I? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, and there's been five meetings so far. Uh, one of them, the first initial meeting, really we didn't we didn't do too much. Just a meet and greet, and how are we um, going to? Uh, 
provide the, the product that the, the state requires. Um, at the first meeting, uh, Chris and I were selected as co-chairs. Um, from there, the second meeting um, was scheduled. Um, that's when we started really formulating who we're gonna, how, how we're gonna, how, who, what, why, where, when, and how, um, so to speak. Um, we started looking at um, risks, opportunities, liabilities, um, things of that nature. Um, one of the, I believe, one of the um, in the in the act was uh, trying to see um, speak with different industries uh, across industry AI across uh, uh, the entire industries of Vermont. Uh, in that regard, we tried um, summarizing different industries in Vermont and. From there, we, we decided we were going to try to speak to um, one one speaker in each industry. Um, from there, um, the deployment would be the last three meetings, and um, we've from those in each of those three meetings, we've tried to categorize industries that are similar in nature. Um, for example, medical, healthcare, and then insurance. Um, Technology, manufacturing, construction, labor, as um, industries. So I believe at the third meeting, um, we did, we looked at uh, we, brought, we asked speakers from the agricultural and natural resources community. Um, mo most most uh, presenters were from uh, UVM. Uh, they talked up again. They talked about different aspects of um, artificial intelligence in, in their field. Uh, the fourth meeting was held in December. Um, that was on uh, 14th, 14th, I believe 14th of December. Uh, that meeting was on transportation and manufacturing, construction and labor. Um, speakers were from the consulting industry uh, of engineering. Um, one of the task force members, I believe, spoke, um, Joe Sigali, uh, from the artificial, uh, for a, from the autonomous vehicle uh, aspect. Um, uh, from the construction industry, um, a contractor um, from the you know, dealing with roads, Roads, bridges, that that uh, that type of construction was brought in. Um, and I know they, he spoke on uh, his personal use of artificial intelligence. Um, and then finally, there was a fifth meeting um, on January 18th, where we spoke to uh, the healthcare industry and um, medical devices industry. Um, most people were from UVM, but I believe there was a southwestern. Regional Medical Center um, speaker as well, um, and again, talking about you know the, the lack of artificial artificial intelligence in their industry or what they're doing doing with artificial intelligence currently, and um, that yeah, so that has been the five meetings thus far. Uh, we're we're planning on the next few meetings uh, to. Uh, Engage the public, get their opinion and input on, on the matter of artificial intelligence, and just see what their input is. Um, and then I guess the you know these last five remaining uh, meetings would be um, trying to provide the state with uh, the final report. So, can you give us just tell us stories of some of the ways we're most successfully seeing artificial intelligence applied for because we see it in our daily lives and we don't all recognize it. Okay, I can give examples. And, and then I guess my question is, it sounds like you're asking us to exempt the public hearings from being included as part of your meetings. And to me, that's what you're, oh, it sounds like you're asking, is that you'd like to have five remaining meetings, but maybe independent of the public meetings. Uh, I, I guess, yes. Because that, 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 the that, public meetings another... you're just listening, you're not. I want Jill's here too, she's on the test. Uh, I, I guess, yes. Oh, I have a different view than you do, Jill Sharpino of Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. As I understand it, we have two, we have, we're doing judicial and criminal justice, so next meeting, the 22nd, and then we'll be doing retail, 
how it impacts retail workers. Uh, we also want to do a series of meetings that goes out to the public right. and hold public forums. Right. But we don't feel we can get that done by right. June 30th, and that's the reason right. for the extension. Uh, yeah, well, we can, we'll talk, but there are some. But I'd love to, yeah, just hear, hear about how you have experienced AI applied. So give us a notion of how it's successfully been. Okay, uh, I can give us several examples. For, again, from the speakers that I've heard of, um, uh, the construction industry, um, we heard from uh, ECI. Um, they are they actually have a labor shortage, or they, they cannot find the amount of um, staff to fulfill the job, their job requirements. So they are actually using um, they they consider it artificial intelligence software programs to better. Um, Place resources, staff members, machinery, equipment across varying jobs across the state. Um, uh, Joe 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 Sigali, um, in the terms of transportation, spoke on um, autonomous vehicles. What's what's there currently, and then what's going um, what's going to happen in the future. Um, at that same meeting. Uh, I forget the guy. I forget the gentleman's name, but he um, he actually drove drove uh, to this to the presentation in a Tesla, and uh, basically said all he had to do was hold on to the steering wheel, and the car drove for him. Um, it was able to uh, detect the center line and white edge lines of the road. Um, Joe Joe mentioned uh, it's it could be anywhere from. Ten years to you know, forty years before we're starting to see autonomous vehicles, but that's open up to open to interpretation. Um, at the agricultural and natural resources um, uh, meeting, I forget the gentleman's name, but he ran a, a dairy farm or dairy uh, product, uh, uh, dairy product for milking cows. He sells th this. Uh, Machine that milks cows on its own, and right. uh, oh, okay, and uh, it's completely hands off, and the the the, uh, the machine knows when to let cows in or out to maximize milking, basically, and it can it's basically a, it learns about their their feed patterns and um, other aspects of you know the cow's nutrition and. How many times a day does it melt the cow, or how many times will it let it into the par the parlor, basically? Um, so uh, that was that was kind of interesting. Um, for the uh, medical, healthcare, and insurance, um, we were dealing with uh, two two uh, presenters spoke on uh, cancer treatments or detecting cancer cells. Artificial, you know, computer software programs are able to. Um, Instead of having the human eye look at the cells, have a computer um, look at the cells and look for abnormalities and um, uh, you know, irregularities in the cells to detect cancer. Um, we have artificial intelligence that's more intelligent than human intelligence. Well, maybe not. They're just one don't of the, we know. One of the one of the at topics during that same discussion was the liability of a computer recognizing uh, a cancer versus a second opinion of the, of, of the of the per, of a doctor or you know the, what what is the liability associated with taking the computer's um, interpretation versus a, you know, a person's. So I wanted to add a oh, few. Also heard from a speaker who did a study, I believe, at Harvard about using Instagram to detect people who might have PTSD and or depression, that there is an ability from how they present themselves to discover whether they might need treatment, and that, that was an application he was very interested in mm -hmm. uh, helping people. We also heard from a person from the Southwest Medical Center who started just using, I think it's like a Windows program from Microsoft, and 
gathering information and streamlining their some of their processes in the hospital himself, just and finding how well it worked and how the uh, the program could detect who was entering the data just by you know their their choice of words, so on and so forth. So people are out there, you know, playing around, using the stuff themselves without necessarily, a, you know, a big program behind them. And the fellow who drove in the, uh, to the meeting in the uh, Tesla is also the head person at Global Foundries for Developing Artificial Intelligence. It's very, uh, a lot of discussion about how does it apply and how do we use it. I heard just with the cars, just as an aside, I heard a fear for who, but somebody who knew what they were talking about that the autonomous vehicles are going to have a harder time navigating dirt roads. Yes, because they use the lines. When there's snow, when there's a lot of snow, they're not going to know where to go. The lines, they use the lines painted on the road. Right. Because so anytime time the lines are obscured, they yeah. have difficult time. There are a lot of lines. It's, um, Chris is going to love this one. I, it's a. I heard this the other day, how you can tell a drunk driver in Vermont. Yes. <laughs> they drive pretty slow and straight because they don't want people to think they're weaving. They hit every potholder. The <laughs> non-drunk driver weaves in and out <laughs> to avoid the potholders. Do you remember that? Um, so I, I, I don't want to, um, I, I want to keep hearing a little more about this, but I'm going to just throw out a suggestion right now for us to consider so that you don't have to wonder if we're going to ever address your requests. Um, that we suggest giving you till January of 2020, that would be a year from now, to come up with a report that we give you um, maybe five or six more meetings. You, would, you wouldn't be able to have more than, because you have five left anyway, right? So between now and next January, you wouldn't be able to, and that you not, um, that the that if you hold like four public hearings, that they not count right. as your meetings, right? Because so you would have you would in effect have like five more meetings left, and then another um, four or five meetings, because so, you're going to have two. The way I look heard you say you're going to have two more fact-finding meetings and yeah. purely talking to people and then you're going to have public hearings and then you're going to need I would think maybe four meetings to start talking about how do how do we how does this impact the state is there any role for the state to play here not not only how can we use it in our own processes but is there is there any segment of this that should be regulated how do how are we as a state going to respond to it that's just going to be my my suggestion for okay. right now and you can yeah. yeah i just wanted to us to get there before i yeah. i would okay. support right. that and exact like three public meetings yeah or every, whatever you were thinking. yeah i'm fine with that. i'm just trying to get a handle so if there's 14 you all get per diems and mileage for each meeting no no or you don't we get squat we just come because we're <laughs> some of us are staying yeah. Okay. Some of us are not. So right. we're not, we're not talking not about uh, thousands, thousands of dollars. Thousands of either. dollars. There's no, no. Money. There's just, um, Brian, uh, China is the only legislator that, that would cost us money. Everybody else is paid. I, 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 I'd like to mention, I believe uh, Kayla is um, compensated for her time. Oh, oh. and Kayla. And she's at her level you know. of compensation, it will break us. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. Kayla is your hidden secret weapon. Do you always meet at the same spot? So far. At, at, yes, at National Life, I believe the building, uh, the room numbers have changed. But okay. National we Life. We plan to, when we go public, to actually go around the state. Good. Yeah. Good. For your We'd love to have yeah. you in Hunter County. I, I second the chair's motion then. I think that's great. Yeah. I, I would arrange just to figure out whether it's three or four public hearings and then five meetings in addition. Good. Make a suggestion. Is there any reason we would limit the number of public hearing public no. meetings? I don't care. You can have twenty of them. That's my point. So really, we're talking about the number of meetings that we can have under the uh, under your authority or the authority of the. the yeah. I mean, I, I mean, if you want to have the more public meetings we have, the better, as far as you're right. Concerned. Yeah, but we want to make sure you still have enough substantive time to talk and, yeah. and make. Right. Right. No, so in addition to the meetings, 
too if many. We don't we, if we only limit or yeah. expand the limit on our the actual meetings, the public meetings are just gravy. Yeah. Yeah, but they aren't always just gravy. They're often yeah. included in our But we're uh, not. We're excluding public meetings from I know that was my idea. I didn't like it. I think it's a good idea. I, I for once I'm with you. <laughs> oh, all the time. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. So, mad at me now. What? I'm not mad. I'm charmed. Oh. So, because I'm not sure why we would want to report in June anyway when we're not around, right? Well, that, so yeah. if we put it till January 15th or something like that, um, then there's time for us to react to the recommendations and for committees of jurisdiction to start. Look at it. Does trans agency of transportation? I mean, Department of Transportation. What a committee of transportation? Do they have a role in here? Are they, are they going to start having different regulations for uh, hmm. self-driven cars or whatever you can call them? So th that'll give us a chance to. Yeah. The one thought I have actually is it, we have a much um, shorter time frame next year for our bill introduction, and well, we're changing that. But we haven't yet. <laughs> so, I mean, we may change it, but uh, at the moment, the Senate has an earlier deadline, and I believe it's in December. Yes. So, one thought might be that this report be due to set in December. December, if we wanted to affect that, or we could do a committee bill any time. Right? No, we can't. We can't do a committee bill any time, but we're changing that. Committee bills are in the Senate have the same deadlines as regular as other bills. But we are, the Rules Committee was going to take that up today, but we went too long on the floor because too many people had to okay. speak. But in lieu of that, do you want to keep your January proposal? Yes. Okay. I, I would keep the okay. January 15th proposed deadline, and we'll get special permission to introduce bills if we need to. So just so I'm clear about this conversation, okay. <laughs> complete, we can complete the report by January 15th, 2020. Public meetings will be excluded from right. counting as our meetings. meeting count. Okay. And then our general meetings, there's five remaining. Okay, you can and wait. we'll add ten. We'll add, I mean, we'll, we'll add, add five. five. So okay. you have ten remaining. Okay. Brian. So I don't want to necessarily prolong this, but it's very fascinating to me. Um, so you had some folks come in, Brian, and Jill and Chris, feel free to add. And they are telling you about the ways in which their particular piece of industry or whatever they do are, are getting affected by this. Did anyone have like bad stuff to say? Like we read somewhere, I don't know where it was, that one of the cars that supposedly could take care of itself ran over somebody in a crosswalk it's been or something. one death, as I understand yeah. it. Have Did anyone have any negative sort of things to say? I, I guess speaking in broad generalities, there's a lot of good things, there's a lot of bad things with what's coming, um, one of which is perhaps labor reduction. Um, so, yeah. Some some of what you know some of the some of these software programs could take away jobs by you know what 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 the the job the per current person is doing sure. and what is capable of this, mm -hmm. these programs. Um, some of them may be good. I mean, I'm not sure a farmer really loves milking. I mean, some of them do probably, well, but it's, but some, some it's a chore at some level. But right, some of them think it's, it's a good thing yeah. in some regards. We saw one at the farm show. Yeah. If you went by it, it was... I've seen, a film. I've seen I, a film of it. Well, we had milking machines, but those were different. You had to slap them on and you had to... Yeah, this one does it, I think, by itself. It does yeah. it yeah, like all by That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, so there are challenges. On the other hand, there are retail oh. stores now that don't have any retail clerks. That's exactly. Yeah. And you go to some fast food places. And you yep. order at a kiosk. Right. So they've eliminated at least one position. Right? Yep. Yeah. On the other hand, all those programs had to be created That's by correct. a human being. And so where one job is taken away, often several are created. Innovation marches on. And sadly, had they had this task force in 1890, they would have been facing the same industrial revolution as, you know, in the 1840s, 50s, 60s. I mean, it, Things evolve, and I think are getting trying to get a handle on how it's going to evolve, and what are the things we need to address to help our workforce deal with it and be prepared for it is in fact what why this is so valuable for us. I don't and, and not just our workforce, but our I, I keep thinking that are are there things out there that we need to create new regulations around? Yes. That yes. I, I, and I have no idea because to be quite honest with you, this is so far above my head that when Brian came in and suggested this 
artificial task force, um, artificial intelligence task force. Um, I thought he was talking about replacing the legislature. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, I, I just, this is not, this is not my area at all. So I, I really need to have the, the knowledge that you gain here put into, into specific steps that I know how to, I know how to um, implement if they, if they need to be. So. I was honest, we've already, we've already discussed in, in the last several meetings about you know, what kind of recommendations mm -hmm. we could offer. Um, I don't want to, I guess, state anything at this time, but we've, we've already been discussing about what could be done, mm -hmm. potentially. Um, again, we would have, you know, I think that would come in the final report. Yeah, I think I have no problem with it. I think it's exciting. Yeah. Definitely interesting. Yeah. Do you know uh, Ben McKinney? Yes. He used to work for my company, Boy and King. How, yeah. do you, how do you know him? I am a good friend of his mother's, and I, his mother, Chris Hart, is my boss in my other life. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of knew him when he was a little kid. but. Sure, he, he I, I, yeah, again, I know him, but he, he actually isn't the one who spoke, uh, Joey Appleton spoke. Yeah, I just, you said you were from the Boy and King. Yep. 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 Anything else? No, no. Sounds like you're doing good work. Yeah, thank you. Right. And thanks for coming. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to, one final thing I wanted to ask was, uh, should, should, should this task force be keeping, uh, obviously Brian Cena is in the, on the task force, he's, you know, being aware, should should the task force be corresponding with this this committee with, for any regard about just on a regular basis, or? No, I think if, if you have questions, if questions come up about where you might go, or you think you need some kind of direction from us, but I think you're you're a, we you the people that are on that task force are the people that we thought were entrusted to to deal with this issue. So I don't. I think that's us. So, and if if um, Brian, if there's something that he feels needs some kind of attention, I'm sure he'll bring it to us. Okay. So, the, who drafted the did Betsy draft the original? No, I think it was Becky Wasserman. Because we have to not, we have to remember now to do this. Yeah. We have, to, we have to draft the bill or do something to extend it. Yeah, we will. And it was I don't remember if it was Becky or. Um, do you know if it was Becky or yeah. Maria? I don't Maybe. know offhand, but I'll look it up. Yeah. I, I, my guess is that. And it was late I, or Helena, maybe. I was thinking Helena. Okay. Well, we'll we will have a, a bill drafted about this. So I have to say, first of all, I'm going to start by saying that we went. Uh, I went to um, Michael Trachter and I went to a meeting in Burlington. We met with um, Rhino Foods, Twin Craft, uh, Hotel Vermont, Lake Champlain Chocolates, the University. Um, yeah, you were there. Services, the university services. The hospitals. The hospitals. Services. The the guy that runs the um, employment. And it was really good. And there were pretty exciting recommendations that came out of there. Some <coughs> more helpful to the business community some helpful to the state, and then some in terms of uh, licensing and OPR, and then some, I thought, in terms of our own workforce, how we can. So given that, I have to say, I read this report. I don't know who wrote this report, but this was the best government report I've ever read. Wow. That was like that. It's going to start good, crying. Though, man. <laughs> I I laughed. I didn't weep, but I laughed and I said, "Oh my God, that is such a how, why did he say that? That is so much fun. Which bottle of hair stuff do you want to use? The one that you can read? You don't have to reform something that hasn't been formed. It's full of literary flourishes and and truly, and I will tell you that uh, same opinion comes from our pro tem. 
Well, that is very, very nice. I, mean, I appreciate it. And we're always, I mean, it really is a privilege just to be able to write things and have them read. You know, um. Well, but some of them are pretty <laughs> poorly written and dully written. So I want to say that the way I think we want to do this is to go <coughs> to look at the report. So we're all really familiar with it. And then we have you on the schedule for next week to start talking about specific really getting into the details of what we we can do that, that this committee can do there's things that other committees can do but how how do we fit into this whole um anyway you know what i mean so okay so okay um so well thank you for your kind words about the report i think we we were kind of privileged to be able to look at it from a from a distance that permitted kind of engagement and thinking broadly about mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, there's good and bad to that in that, that we're working at a very general level. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about all occupational license and uh, professional licensing in the workforce, we're talking about about 120,000 Vermonters of mm -hmm. which for um, OPR's jurisdiction extends to about half. Mm -hmm. um, others are licensed by uh, entities such as the Agency of Education, the Department of Health, um, uh, DPS. So um, as we approach this, one of the nice things about being OPR and the Government Operations Committees is that the structure of our law, if you're going to deal with, you know, if you're trying to drive high-level policy um, across diverse professions, because we have the umbrella structure that you're all familiar with from your previous committee work with Title III laying out rules of general application for all of the individual columns of profession, and then each individual column occupying a chapter in Title 26. Um, whereas in some states where we don't have a structure like that, one would have to go in profession by profession, make amendments to idiosyncratic laws, and each time you do, the, the profession thinks it's been singled out and says, why are you doing this? Whereas uh, in the structure that, that you have, you're able to go in, it's very simple mechanically because you can apply a rule of general application directly in Title III and have it distributed out to all the Title 26 chapters. Um, and it's politically uh, easy because nobody feels picked on. Is, you know, if somebody says, well, why have we been selected for this? You say, well, we really haven't. The same rule is applying to dentists yeah, as to nurses um, as to electrologists. Um, so it makes it, makes it very um, nice uh, both for you, for Ledge Council, and for us to be able to attack large-scale problems like this um, where the solution is a rule of common application in many cases. And if I may add, we have done that with um, military licensing. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of where Title III application has applied across all of our programs um, in one spot. Um, so that is a, an approach that we would recommend with regard to this population as well. And I, I actually have to <clears throat> say that I liked your approach in here about matching the individual needs of the um, immigrant community <coughs> and with the business needs and with the state needs. And I underlined this one here. The liberty interest of people to fulfill their human potential by applying their trades for the benefit of those who wish to engage them converges with an economic imperative to make Vermont welcoming. I, I mean, it's, it put, trying to put those things together is very, I think, unique in a government report. We're, we're, we're really lucky, too, to have this particular subject matter. I and mean, I think may, getting this right is a tripartisan issue. Whether you care mm -hmm. about, you know, whether you care about economic development, see the world through that lens, whether you care about individual liberty and see the world through that lens, yeah. you come to the same conclusion. And that this is a really neat area of subject matter to, yeah. to work with because what's good for one is good for all, kind of. Um, so, and it's a very significant, I was surprised myself when our, our data and stats analyst is responsible for digging up some of the, the percentages and whatnot. I mean, when you consider on the numbers how many people we're talking about who were born overseas, um, that we're trying to accommodate and that we're competing for in many cases. Um, at 15% of the RN workforce, that's 150% of the number of RNs who are left-handed. I mean, consider that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really a lot of people. And um, so the, the effects are non-trivial uh, of getting this right. And as the chair said, 
we are in some ways in an economic competition to become attractive and welcoming to skilled professionals. Um, oh, yeah. We are, Vermont can do more than the United States is at the moment. Open its arms. In some ways, that some. creates opportunities for us yeah. to say, you know, this is a place where you can come and you can maximize your potential based on the learning you've done, and we will ensure that it is not unduly difficult for you where it might be other places. Um, and so when we looked at the, when we began the report, we started um, with the obvious questions. You know, how, how many citizenship mandates do we have? And in many states, those are common, where there's just sort of an unreasoned, you know, you've got to be a citizen in order to qualify. Um, and then we asked the same question about English language mandates. In, in professional licensing, there are cases where English proficiency may be relevant to whether or not one can safely uh, provide services to, English, to an English-speaking public, but they're fewer than one thinks. Um, and we can go into that in a little bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, we asked those high-level questions and then surveyed the, our statutes and our administrative rules. And what we found was pretty encouraging. This state, by comparison to most, um, is relatively free of arbitrary citizenship mandates. Um, we wrote in the report about the couple we found, but they were more about board and commission membership than they were about who may be licensed. And so that's really fortunate. The only licensing mandate of all the funny things uh, was notaries. I think one has to be a citizen to be a notary. We were talking about those on Tuesday. I'm getting ready. Right. <laughs> we just passed that one. <laughs> there is some rational reason why that might be imposed. But um, in many ways, the news is good if you look at our existing statutes and rules by comparison to those of other states. They are comparatively free of, of unnecessary language barrier or uh, language proficiency mandates and unnecessary citizenship mandates, so that we don't see a, a, a proliferation of those that we would have to untie. Um, both this body and the administrative agencies adopting rules have been judicious in their use of those requirements. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if everybody actually had a chance to read in depth. <coughs> Would you no, I have, talk, I have to admit I haven't read it yet. Would you so, talk but, some about the the immigration statistics, the demographics in Vermont? I don't know if you you're kind of past that in your in the report, but if, I, I think that's really important. Sure. I mean, from, from our analysts, we have uh, an assessment that uh, immigrants making up thirteen and a half percent of the national population, seventy percent of the active workforce. Um, that's an extraordinary number of people, and many more than I would have intuitively. Um, Thought. I think many more than many Vermonters would have been probably thought. Um, <clears throat> even more outsized uh, immigrant representation in the STEM professions, in the, in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics professions, um, at 40% of medical scientists, 28% of physicians and surgeons, 15% of RNs. Um, and so, you know, again, to ben benchmark that, the half your population, or 10% of your population is left handed. But, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, when you think of the scale there, that's a really significant, to be able to do that in the medical sciences where most oh. of our licensing is, um, and in engineering, um, you know, you're working where in, in professions where people able to do those jobs are, or immigrants are overrepresented among those folks. So the effects of improving things there can really be non-trivial. So these are national statistics. These aren't they are. Vermont uh, workforce statistics. Is it roughly similar to Vermont, or do we not have the data in Vermont? We don't have great data. The, we're small enough in size, and I had asked our analyst about that, that the federal government wants us in with other states, and we can't disaggregate Vermont from the other state where we're data pooled with. Um, so th that's what we're looking at. Um, oh, I apologize. On the fourth page of the report, thank yeah, you. There, there are Vermont there, there are indeed yeah. Vermont. But, but on this, I mean, like, anecdotally, we can all talk about the number of our doctors now who are, are uh, uh, who, yeah. If you look at page four, four uh, yeah, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so you're looking at, you know, in Vermont we have a smaller immigrant population than you know, the coastal states, for example, at 4% of the state population, so more, but no surprise to most of us that um, the state is a little bit more homogenous than others um, demographically, but even so, um, uh, a considerable uh, immigrant representation. Notably, and this becomes important to the recommendations, Canada is the biggest contributor, um, and Canada um, 
is sort of a special case too, because as we later on in the report we talk about just sort of the practical realities of it's never going to be possible to send a bureaucrat like me out and say, well, just go figure out what the license equivalents are to every country on earth. It's quite possible to do that with Canada. And you can look into the provinces. They have um, regulatory systems that are a lot like ours. Um, they have uh, graduate education systems that are a lot like ours. They do differ in some ways. We've actually seen, you know, it's, it's need to be OPR because you, I think we may perceive problems a little bit more rapidly because they're hitting us in multiple fields. And we have seen that with, you know, one of the unique characteristics of the Canadian education system and graduate education system and some European systems compared to the United States systems is that the educational apparatus is more tightly controlled by the state and often administers the licensing exam. Right. And we had this case with Canadian engineer coming in. We said, well, where's your, your Canadian national exam? And he said, well, I graduated the engineering program. <laughs> What's right. your problem? And you know, in that system, and this was, and that was from Quebec, equivalent. that was the equivalent. And, um, but most of our laws and rules are written to presume that everybody's training system looks like ours when in fact um, we are a bit of an outlier for relying upon independent third parties for um, a great deal of occupational testing. Um, so we... Uh, well, know. it's not, the European system is much more like our apprenticeship and in uh, programs where by just by virtue of going through the apprenticeship program you are certified. Yes, I think there are more apprenticeship programs, and similarly, their um, graduate, you know, their university but I mean, graduate, graduate program, education all programs. programs are kind of like the apprenticeship. Yeah, so you would, you would, when you graduate from school in America, you almost always have to take a test yeah. after you're done. And, and, in, and in the provinces, when you graduate from a higher education, you're, you don't have to take another test. You are done. Um, I think the, the statistics would shock probably most Vermonters, it did me, that there are, they are 56% more likely to have a graduate yeah. degree. Yeah. That I, and I think that when, unfortunately, when we think of immigrants, or at least recent immigrants, joining the workforce, and stuff, we think of them at entry level mm -hmm. positions, and we don't take into account at all the, the training that they've had. I mean, I, 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 I found that really, Really? It's funny. I and I just guess I've had so many doctors that, that are that are a, particularly a, Asian. I mean, and my face bears the marks of a Persian who was my fabulous skin doctor and did two cancer surgeries on my nose. On my, and so, you know, I think of all great Mohs surgery people being Persian now. <laughs> I mean, I, I, th I, I think that we experience a lot in the medical world, and we don't even think about it. Well, we do, but we, when, when you say immigrant, that is not the vision, I think, that comes to most Vermonters' minds. I think so. I may that's be wrong, but... The coverage that's been done, yeah. farm workers, yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, sure. things like that. One thing that really came to my mind at the meeting up in Burlington was I wondered how many of the people who were working at Twin Craft etc could have had a professional license option yes. if it, there was a clear pathway and so um, I want to make sure that we are working with those communities even in the right. business communities to help their employees gain professional licensure okay. or um, their their spouses their children whatever um, permutation um, that, that we are integrating with the business community because I think that there's skilled professionals who are immigrants who are working in manufacturing jobs yeah. um, because they don't know how to parlay their experience in their, in their home country into this new country. And the other thing that was really amazing is from that meeting for me was the conversation of the networks. I would have assumed that the immigration networks were very intense, but not being part of one myself, I didn't understand <coughs> how um, you know, people were saying that people, um, that an employee will bring in other employees to come work. And so I, if, I think if OPR and the state in general in licensing were able to be more open, we'd be able to um, be more accessible to those communities. And right now, we've done not enough work 
reaching out to those Almost communities. Almost no average. Well, yeah. we're starting. Yeah. Yeah. We're starting. This yeah. is a good start. This has, uh, and I, I <laughs> frame this report as, you know, we did this in a hurry on a shoestring while we we're pretty spread pretty thin. What's great about it is, you know, I think it's the beginning and not the end of a conversation about this topic. You know, we had been before this committee in previous sessions talking relentlessly about interstate mobility and trying to improve the fluidity of the United States labor market among the states. And this is the next rational step in that effort. Um, you know, terribly important, and as we talked about, not just important to our economy, but important to maximizing the human potential of the people who are here. It, uh, just a, it's a tragedy to have someone uh, who has attained substantial, expensive, difficult training show up in the wrong jurisdiction before a regulator who just to whom it means nothing. It just means nothing. Oh, heartbreaking. And that's the frustrating thing about licensing. The, the flip side of that is licensing must enforce a standard. And if it doesn't, you know, we will either endanger people or and or cause our credentials to cease to be recognized by others <coughs> because they can't know what the credential really signifies. So it is important to maintain that that core function, the protective function of licensing. But in so many cases, there are ways to be less binary. You know, the, the trouble is, you either check every single box and you get the license and you're okay, or you're missing one of them or all of them, and that's all the same to us because you're not having it. And the challenge and the opportunity here is to find ways, whether it is through credentials verification services, which do exist and are incorporated in some of the larger licensing programs in nursing and medicine, for example, um, and bring that to a broader range of professions because although those exist, there really is little legal and administrative structure for using them uh, outside of the, the large, large professions. And so we can do a better job, and one of our recommendations is to consider Title III language that gives a place to credential verification, uh, some structure around how it would occur, and then what would be the legal effect if the director, for example, were to conclude that a credential has been certified as equivalent, um, then you could say to all of the licensing boards under Title 26, thou shalt recognize that as the equivalent to what you're asking for. Um, so all of those are, are kind of neat opportunities to do simple things to be a little bit less binary. Um, an additional recommendation that we talk about is making possible bridge licensing. Right now, when people like Lauren and I and the people we work with talk about limited licensing, it's always of somebody who's been disciplined. You know, you have some kind of practice deficiency, you hurt a patient, it would be typical to do, you know, because of misconduct or malpractice, we would condition a license and say somebody has to work with you, you have to work under somebody's supervision while we make sure that you're up to standard. There's really no provision like that for people who haven't done anything wrong, but who may come from a situation where you were three quarters of the way through graduate school when the war started. You, uh, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, but it is impossible for us as regulators to verify that you meet the standard that we need you to meet. Is there something we can do? And often that would be a non-disciplinary bridge program where we could take a Vermont licensee we knew met standard who was established in the field pair you with that person and then have a period of supervised practice and then apply perhaps the domestic exam that we've always applied to everyone to verify that you have a book learning, verify your clinical experience uh, through a bridge program and enable you to attain a license that you might not otherwise have been able to attain without repeating a substantial piece of the education you've had already done. That's a way to expand the concept of apprenticeships um, into programs that are not apprenticeship friendly, the bridge licensing. So, I'm just sorry, I'm just looking for that in your recommendations, and I, I just don't see bridge in, in the title of any one of them, but I clearly have it here. I, I read it many times, I don't remember where. Leveraging apprenticeships. Oh, it's on the top, the top of the last page for one that talks about bridge programs. At one, I, kept, I changed terminology on here a few times. At one point, I think on page 11, the heading calls it transitional licensing. Yes, I just didn't see that. Okay, establishing <coughs> transition, translation, that's translation. Well, procedure. on the top of the last page, it does refer to it. The last page? The third heading on page 11. So I apologize if you get at the bottom rather than the top, there's the. Yeah. Um, authorized, non-disciplinary, conditional, limited, and transition uh, license. And then I refer to the bridge programs on the next page. So. And, 
I, I should say this committee and OPR, you know, are sort of in an advantage position in terms of perceiving these the, the areas that needed to be sanded off and improved as cases come at us. And just in the past few years, uh, you through the OPR bill relieved substantial burdens on immigrant dentists and nurses. Um, until I think it was last year. Yeah, it was until it was until last year. last year, until this summer. Um, if one did not have a domestically earned DDS or DMD degree, you could simply never be a general dentist. You're kidding. That is true. And we were one of the last states to get rid of that requirement. I think we were the fifth to be. We were the the last what the last of five. And as a um, result, have you? Is it too early to see how many have applied? We've already seen an uptick. I think right. the, the, the internet's an amazing thing, and I think people find out. And um, uh, but yeah, the solution that was applied in last year's bill really works pretty simply. It says we have terrific grad and, and relatively short graduate dental specialty programs that are so like periodontics and. Um, but also orthopedic um, um, braces. Orthodontist. Um, orthodontist, yes, not orthopedics. We don't want feet in the mouth. Um, well, we've got mouth. a lot of that. I know. <laughs> the, the, the mouth. Big shortage in periodontics, etc. And, you know, we, we talked to the dental board and the Vermont State Dental Society and looked at our own folks and, and we thought, you know, we have, these are competitive graduate programs. They're not letting in anybody who applies. They, they'll they do the screening of how was your overseas yeah. general dentistry yeah. training. Yeah. And then once they have graduated, if they had what it took to get admitted to that competitive program and they had what it took to pass that competitive specialty program, we don't need to worry so much about where did the general dentistry training come from. And so in that way, um, it is now possible, effective just the past summer, to um, become a general dentist in the United States, though you did not do your primary training here, before that you would have read to repeat dental school. I mean, consider how wasteful that is. Um, so that we think is terrific for Vermonters. It's, you know, we, we need more dentists, we need more access to dental care, um, and fair to people as well. Um, a similar thing presented itself in nursing, where there were, because of a quirk in our statute, if you were, I think it was the practical nursing chapter we amended the last um, year, if you were educated overseas again and you hadn't gone right to work, even if every, I don't know that every state around us would license you, but I know that Massachusetts would, and you know, even if Massachusetts and Maine had given you a nursing license and let you work for the past 30 years, and you've done great, yeah, under, because our law, you know, I don't think it was intentional, but because our law was written around the presumption that you would have domestic training, you were just out of luck in Vermont. And so we changed that. So, I mean, the good news, the bad news is things like this can happen if you're inattentive. The good news is that over the years, and in part because we run an annual bill through these committees correcting um, unfair situations or undesirable situations that we observe, when we've detected a problem like this, because of our partnership with you and because of the annual nature of the bill, we've been able to correct it quickly. Um, but there, there is more work to be done. Um, you know, I don't think there are many states where you know, people in Lauren's shoes and mine would have the kind of relationship with the legislature and with the professional community to just say, okay, this happened, that can't happen again, let's, let's make sure it's fixed and have it done within the year. That's really, you know, we're lucky to be in this state. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to take any questions you have or to walk through the, the baseline recommendations. Um, one of the other um, items that, that we noticed when kind of going through our law to look for unnecessary and arbitrary barriers and of the simplest kind was that we're not the only source of them. And we need to remember how many third parties we rely on in the administration of these licensing programs. Um, and that's a real blind spot to us where you know, we're realizing we have to be, we have to scrutinize carefully who we rely on because although Vermont law will usually say the director will examine, Lauren isn't sitting at her desk writing the optometry examination, obviously we have a third party um, national administrator. Can, can I read this paragraph in case people haven't, have you read the whole report? Okay, I, I just want to read this paragraph which goes to that because I think it's one of the funniest okay. paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> on page 10. OPR it's recently the discovered that the provider on which it relied for cosmetology examination refused to translate its exam, refused to allow a translator in the exam room, 
and zealously enforced an English-only requirement in respect even to the labels on cosmetic products and devices used by examinees. This meant that the provider, not the state, decided that English language proficiency was pre prerequisite to licensure as a cosmetologist. The provider explained its rule is necessary to protect the public, but the explanation takes nothing. In a forced choice between hair dye instructions your stylist can understand and hair dye instructions you can understand while captain sitting in a chair, go with the bottle the stylist can read. <laughs> this is, if you haven't read the report, the whole thing reads like that. Well, we, yeah. the, the deputy chess secretary of state has worked very hard to get me to stop doing things just like that. <laughs> no, 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 to what? remove what? No, <laughs> no, no, not to remove humor, like, to remove his legalese in Latin. <laughs> But, but I love this Latin, are but, you kidding? But the thing is, um, you know, no, there's a huge difference between English proficiency yes. and conversation. And to have a barrier to a marketplace based on English proficiency by a third party that we weren't even aware yeah. was doing that. So that was, was hard. the third party. That, that was a third party. So we were hearing stories of nail technicians who were struggling to pass the exam. And we were saying, why? They've done the apprenticeship. They should understand what yeah. they're doing. It's because of this exam provider. And um, so we're trying to create a third avenue, a third rail to get into the profession, not based why on Why don't we just get rid of the third, that examiner? That's yeah. happening. Um, also, as a result of last year's bill, um, we yeah. are you, you cut substantially in last year's bill the number of hours required, which should really become extraordinary. Um, implemented in last year's bill a, one of the most liberal entry requirements in the country where if you can show you were working anywhere in the world for a year in the profession and verify it, we have no other questions and you can have a license um, in the barber and cosmetology nail technician professions. Um, so simple things like that and what Lauren's talking about and what you're seeing there and which is kind of illustrated in this kind of knee slapping way which I guess isn't funny if it hits you though, I mean that we learned about this because of a real human being. Um, is that smart, and we say elsewhere in the report, smart immigrant licensing policy starts with smart licensing policy, and that in turn starts with really sticking with the Chapter 57 principles that OPR tries to make sure drive its, its policy opinions. Um, and one of those goes straight to this English language thing. Is that we have to remind ourselves why we license, and the primary reason we license somebody is to level off information asymmetry out there in the marketplace. It's a big deal <coughs> if the person that I think is an oncologist is faking it. That's a big deal. Uh, and so the government steps in and verifies that the person, in fact, has the training that a medical doctor would have, and the hospital makes sure the person has the tertiary board credentials that the person should have. But as you move into other areas, we begin inquiring into things that are irrelevant that, to anything the consumer doesn't already know. Language is a great example of that. If I go to a hairstylist and I conclude for myself that he or she and I are not communicating effectively enough for me not to come away looking in a way I don't want to be made to look, I can just say thanks a lot. I think look at the time. I'll, you know, I'll, maybe I'll go down the street. I don't need the government to tell me that because it is plainly obvious when you converse with another person whether or not you're conversing effectively, whatever the reason is. Um, so it's, you know, the government sort of, in many of the states where the, these requirements obtain, especially about language, it's sort of the state stepping in to say, well, we'll make sure you're protected from this thing that you could very well see with your own eyes. And so um, or that... Or could be managed on the employer level yes. as well. I mean, yeah. it's not just the consumer, you know, for a foreign trained nurse, for example, who may not have English proficiency um, by a state, by a national exam or a state exam, maybe have excellent bedside manner, may, and may with just a little training, be able to um, handle the entire um, population on the floor, and that should be managed by the employer, not by me in an office. Um, so. So it, the, exactly this, I mean, you're not going to find yourself in a professional role without encountering either a client who knows how well he or she communicates with you, or a, in the health sciences, a hiring committee. I, nobody just says, oh, you're in. I mean, you, you get interviewed. And um, so, so whenever we impose a requirement, whether it's language or any other, we ought to be asking ourselves over and over, is this really a relevant and necessary test to apply for the purpose of protecting the public before somebody gets this license? In a remarkable number of cases, the answer is no. 
Um, and there are other areas where we have to be careful of intermediaries with good intentions imposing requirements we didn't intend. A good example is in the rehabilitation of people with minor criminal pests. This body has been very clear over the years, as is the, as is the judiciary, that we want to favor rehabilitation. We, yes. We're not going to use professional regulation and licensing to apply a secondary punishment for punitive purposes to somebody who did something wrong 5, 10, 15 years ago. And that's good policy. The trouble then can occur, and I think this may have happened with pharmacy technicians before we liberalized the created more avenues in, you get a national uh, certifying authority that begins to build a program and it matures and they start to write their own requirements yeah, and all of a sudden they're, they're jacking the balance. criminal backgrounds of people. And we think to ourselves as, license, as a licensing authority, wait a second, we got a legislature that told us what to do and I'm not real comfortable that somebody before I even know it and without my knowledge or any, any system for appeal as we have when the government itself does this sort of thing, is telling a group of people, well, you, your DUI one from 15 years ago means you can't be a pharmacy technician. I don't know that anything that egregious is happening, but in many, many cases, we do have intermediaries applying tests we often don't even know about because we haven't worked. Um, and if I would just may, we are pretty um, committed to continuing to review those instances in OPR. Um, this report was a great opportunity to sort of do an quick, fast, um, not thorough introspection of our programs, our third parties, but um, we did not have an opportunity to review AOE's third party, public safety's third party. We'll talk because about we that. Yeah. We oversee the principal here, and I think the principal yeah. is but, but I think that there are, um, I, I would just, uh, one of the things that when you were talking about it, it uh, reminded me that the exam itself I mean the written exam itself, and we ran into this with law with the academy, where there would be a, a an incident described, and then five um, responses. Which one is the right response? And the person knew exactly what the response should be, but English is such a nuanced, nuanced and crazy language that you couldn't tell, in reading them, you couldn't tell the difference between them. So um, I, they have re-looked at their exam to try to, to try to, but there might be ex other exams for professions where the exam itself is, is, is um, yeah. Well, we even have a barrier um, when someone comes into our office off the street or calls us we don't have um, a great translation service oh, to utilize. Yeah, that. Um, that can happen to us in a professional conduct hearing, or if somebody um, is wanting to inquire how they get licensed, we can have some language barriers. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we want people to understand what's mm -hmm. required of them, what's so, in the application. So um, that isn't available in state government for you to say, we need this and call somebody to get it? I mean, surely there are tons of translators in the state government. There's in the executive licensing bureaucracy, remarkably few. In the judiciary, for example, there's you know a language line set up where if I go to the <coughs> if I go to the court clerk's office and, and we have a, a cooperative agreement here on sharing resources. It, it's certainly something to look at. I mean as between the two separate you know judicial and executive branches of government that could be a challenge, but in terms of you know plenty of the executive does have this solved. Yeah, AHS, AHS does this. And so, it, and within, DMV, so that's within the administration. Five, only five languages in DMV. That's what we heard. Yeah, that's pathetic. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, those that could be just taken up with ones we already know, and not unusual ones are not in, uh, reflective of the latest inflow of well, uh, AHS immigrants. has when you get information from AHS, it um, it lists about twenty languages on the front <coughs> that you can. So maybe AHS, AHS, you could. Have I won't prom make promises on their behalf. I don't know how thin stretch they are, but we absolutely should look at those yeah. pieces of the executive branch that are already doing this right and see if we yeah. can get on board. Because in licensing, as Lauren said, when someone comes to our office, uh, we don't necessarily have a ready well, way to communicate. You need to start developing those. I mean, you can call at least and can help. Yeah, I mean, right now we're relying on relatives quite frequently, um, but that's not sufficient and not quite frankly not welcoming um, and um, not the right 
and not professional, not professional, not the right look for our office. Um, we need we need something more. I wonder if there is an <coughs> internet an app that translate. That, and I wonder if there's an app that you guys could get that in it, that could do almost simultaneous translation like the UN has. There is such but a thing. I mean, in fact, there is. You can actually, as my phone goes off. Um, there are apps that will translate text. You literally put the camera and get a translation. How accurate they are in terms of capturing nuance and a document of legal significance, I think, is a is well, or with a human being who's at your door. I mean, how do you get an app that then can translate what they're saying mm -hmm. so that you can understand it in real time? That, I think that exists. I bet you dollars to donuts that exists. Oh, I, I don't doubt that you're right. I, I'm not certain of how perfected that technology is. But the basic, you know, could it's you an please, opportunity. You know, to communicate, could you please show me where the nearest bathroom is? I think such an app exists. Well, I'm interested in dentistry, or I'm interested <coughs> in, you know, I was a dentist in Somalia. Yes. How can you help me? And, yeah, I think this language translation is a big unexplored area for most of the licensing bureaucracy, including LPR. So we can, you know, it's an area where we can do better. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to um, take questions you may have or to walk through the kind of concrete recommendations that we had, had suggested. I mean, we really tried to look at this in terms of, as we've already talked about, the very broad view of a very broad range of professions. We don't mean to make it all sound easy. There are some areas where the technical specificity is such that you really might not be able ever to to truly make the column friendly to an applicant from an educational system that you really couldn't see on the ground. But in so many, you can. Um, and often, that just means doing smart things. It also means not imposing licensing barriers generally that don't need to be there. Um, we talk in the report about, and we've had calls like this from people who have moved to Vermont from other states or to Vermont from other countries who wanted to get into massage therapy, which is the subject of the Sunrise, where we discourage regulating that field. And it was for reasons just like we've seen. People call saying, okay, you know, uh, I'm biting my lip and I'm getting ready to start the three-month process of proving out much stuff to you. And we say, no, you know, our legislature said we really don't need to be in there. You, you know, go register with corporations in five minutes and go forth. You know, and we get emails back from people saying, I can't believe I can do that. I just, you know, it's amazing to me that I can do that. Um, so good immigrant licensing policy starts with good licensing policy. Um, uh, and we, so we talk in the report about leveraging apprenticeship. That's something that matters not only to uh, immigrant professionals, but also to young Vermonters and mid-career oh. changers. The student loan debt is a major economic issue to the point that I think serious uh, policy, students of policy are very concerned that it's having an effect on home ownership. It was having an effect on the home buying market. Uh, it was having an effect on the upward mobility of young people. Um, so apprenticeship solves many of these problems at once. Um, and it is especially, you know, where you may have somebody from an immigrant community is most comfortable mentoring under with somebody from the same community or who may have a common language with that person. Um, it's a great way to accomplish a lot of that professional training and verification. And I feel like we're coming from a, a period of years in the 90s and early aughts when apprenticeship was seen as this kind of medieval thing that was, you know, let's get rid of it. In fact, you, we see we have a couple of disused apprenticeships, um, particularly in view, first, of the uh, effect apprenticeship can have on making professional categories more open to uh, folks from other states and other countries, and also because of the effect apprenticeship can have on combating unnecessary student loan debt. Um, we really think it's a very important future model that to the extent that we've got disused categories, we should um, revive them and we are actually doing that in uh, barber and cosmetology, etc., uh, funeral service, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we would look to do that. Opticians, mm -hmm. there's something in the OPR bill this year on an apprentice track for them. Um, we're actually very well suited. Um, just in, within the state, I think OPR is better seated than it has been more integrated with the Department of Labor. I'm now on a workforce development subgroup specifically on a valuable credential and what that means. And that, that group is fascinating um, because it, I pointed out to them last time that we didn't have any anybody there from the refugee or immigrant community and so we're going to try and figure out how to invite someone um, from that community to that subgroup to come talk to us. 
but um, you know, it has the agency of education with the technical programs, DOC with their internal programs. So, are you on our career pathways uh, subgroup? No, I'm you're on, on the credentialing. I'm subgroup. on the credentialing. So I'm on the career pathways one, which yeah. in some ways that would be interesting. To so to yeah, it would be. So yeah, so we're talking about, and at least from my view. Um, OPR is seated closer to the table with other people who are working on the same things. Right. And I think that that's a goal um, clearly expressed in this report too, is that we need more communication, more inter-reliance on each other um, between agencies, between how licensing agencies do it, but not just our licensing silos, but also the Department of Labor. We need to integrate with the Department of Labor to help them understand what we're doing so that they understand the apprentice track in barber and cosmetology and so that AOE, who's running the tech program, understands the apprentice track in cosmetology and barbering so that we can funnel people into these programs into a valuable career pathway and, and professional license or um, occupational license. A plumber, an electrician, plumber and electrician in Vermont, that's a very good career at this moment. <laughs> So um, that in some of our in some of our professions is at the higher end of our income potential. So um, right. getting people integrated into those services, whether they're immigrant populations or native Vermonter. So to that end, I would uh, now that you're part of that working group, which is great, um, uh, with Sarah Buxton or Jess. Uh, I would encourage you to also see how OPR could integrate itself into the one-stop portals that the WIOA money is financed, uh, that are in, being rolled out around the state. There'll be one in each county, and you know it's really going to hopefully be a one-stop place for people with with all their needs related to <coughs> training, to work for, to uh, to work, to everything. And it would be great for you guys and to be a piece of that. Citizenship is not a requirement of WIOA, is it? No, I don't think so. I, I wasn't sure about that. Uh, but I would, I would, you know, you now are working with Sarah and Jess, I assume. Yes, yes. Sophia, so I would, Sophie Yeager. And well. Sophie Yeager. And Sophie Yeager is not DOL, though. <coughs> but, uh, I'm but, but Sarah and Jess yes. are. And they, they are really um, very interested in this kind of work. Great. Right. So I just have a question about the, the um, deal raised is, do the national licensing or credentialing um, programs uh, have any impact on this and how do we deal with that? Um, by national, you mean credential? Um, They're usually credentialing programs, not licensing, right? Yes, I mean, there's kind of a complex, I mean, across the professions, there's kind of this complex web of governmental and non-governmental mm -hmm. certifying going on. For example, there, as you know, there's a one MD license, a doctor's license that we issue, that the uh, Board of Medical Practice issues, and they don't distinguish a pulmonologist from a heptologist. That's all happening at the level of non-governmental board certification and mm -hmm. accreditation. Um, and the medical field is doing a very good job they, oh, they of um, recognizing immigrant professionals. It's not, um, it's not uh, without weight that there are so many immigrant um, doctors. It's because they rely on um, what Gabe's discussing in um, I think it's page nine at the bottom, the third, um, no, it is page, I'm sorry page eight at the bottom, the uniform credential verification yeah. process. The medical, particularly the physician community, has really um, needed to rely on that. Um, and th there has been um, a, a demand for um, physicians that exceed our national borders. And so that um, third party credential verification has been very effective there. Um, and I don't think that, um, license uh, certification in those fields require citizenship or English proficiency. They're all exam based and, and third party law verified. And we're going to have 3,500 nurse shortage in 10 years. 3,500 nurses shortage of, the, of nurses. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, an in, it's a, certainly an interesting time and a good time to open ourselves up to skilled yeah. people from elsewhere. Um, so some I think to Gail's question, some exam services 
um, we still need to do some inquiry into this. Whether some national exams might require graduation from a national school, whether some national um, exams may require English proficiency, um, whether um, a certification body, say an APRN certification body, may have some of those requirements baked within it that we're not familiar with. That's, that's work that we still need to do. So I don't have a clear answer. Um, I don't think Gabe has a clear answer either because we know of it in some spaces. Um, for instance, in the cosmetology exam, that, that was the one that, that really hit us in the face um, this year um, but, and required us to in inquire. But we, sh we should be inquiring um, across all of our now 48 programs. And there are real challenges here in the sense that, you know, nationally, the states tend to <coughs> force one another up a credential escalator. And if you deviate from it, you can have negative unintended effects on the outportability of your own people and the, therefore the desirability of your license. For example, if we said, you know, in the column of social work, we don't really think anymore you, have a, you need to have a master's degree. Um, other states could quickly start saying, well, you can't endorse in from Vermont because they're not equivalent to our um, credentials, and we could have a counterproductive effect. Um, unfortunately, as, these, as time wears on, the you know, degree inflation happens and the credential escalator happens, and it's a very hard cycle to break, and I don't want to you know, make it all rosy in the sense that we can just do X and not have any consequences. In some cases, if you deviate from the national model, you can have negative effects on your licensees um, and the desirability of your license. Um, and if you deviate a lot, you stop performing the core public safety, the public protection function, but in so many cases, we're not even close to that line. So I know it was mentioned when we did the walkthrough of the Secretary of State's office, um, how OPR received the Federal Department of Labor grant um, specific to reducing barriers um, of entry to professions. Um, one of the four focus groups of that grant, so there's four focus groups, let me back up, there's four focus groups for that grant, um, one being immigrants, um, the other being the chronically poor and underprivileged, um, third um, is people with criminal backgrounds, and fourth is um, military families. So. Um, OPR responded to a grant, again, with brilliant writing from Gabe, um, and we were awarded a grant, a three-year grant, $150,000 every year for three years. Um, we have started working with that, and we're part of a consortium of states. Um, we're one of ten. Um, and so there are conversations happening at the national level on licensing with the National Council of State Governments is the that sort of liaison and head of this um, occupational licensing work through the De Federal Department of Labor. Um, so there are conversations happening about how to reduce barriers for immigrants. The other thing is that members of our boards and um, Gabe and I for our advisor professions do go to um, national regulatory associations. So these are the people who normally administer the tests. So for in social work, we go to the ASWB meetings and they promulgate and um, offer the test. And um, one thing that is imperative as a small state of Vermont is that we can go to those meetings and say, hey, hey what are we doing about accessibility to, my, to the migrant professional? And you know, we're just Vermont, but Vermont is very mighty. And as we know, and we can affect some change on the national level, or at least prompt some well, conversations. We're just asking those questions at those meetings. So what were the four groups again? Low-income immigrant? Um, people uh, with criminal backgrounds and military families. And we have six of our regulatory programs selected. Barber and cosmetology, funeral, PI and security, pharmacy, um, real estate, and nursing. And it was it was a grant to look at barriers for licensing, barriers to all licensing of barriers. So it was specific to um, professional licenses that did not require a baccalaureate degree. So um, it was uh, the goal of the grant was to reduce barriers of entry to professions that did not require a baccalaureate degree with those four populations in mind. It is interesting that the ratcheting up of the educational requirements because, and it seems to me that it's probably kind of cyclical, the more 
the fewer people you have going to school, the more emphasis the colleges put on having a degree and put pressure on their accrediting people to get more people to come to school. So then it just keeps. <coughs> I was part of that rat race. race. This is something to look out for, and we are seeing in the professions this devious a little bit from immigrant-specific um, matters. But I mean, dem oh, dem <laughs> yeah, we that's Laura and I have been working this session, and the OPR bill will reflect um, an effort to modernize the athletic trainer scope of practice. Yeah, in speaking with our advisors, though, and this is not an isolated case, but a good illustration of it. Just as we have third-party intermediaries imposing requirements about criminal background or language proficiency we didn't know about, we it is possible for an accreditor to wag the dog in a way oh, sure. and say, you know, in a few years, you're you know, used to be a bachelor's profession, and I'm now it's going to be a master's profession. Used to be a master's yeah. profession, now, now it's going to be, be a doctor. PhD. Okay. Um, and the academy is not going to tell you that's unnecessary. They're going to tell you the high schoolers come to us knowing less every year, and you know, and um, you know. So now the bachelor's degree is the new high school diploma, the master's is the new associates, whatever. Um, but look out for it because the the net effect can be really pernicious for young people. Oh. Where athletic training used to be a baccalaureate training program, and then you were ready to enter the marketplace and provide those services. Sure. With you know four years of debt isn't good, but it's fewer than seven. And we're watching that go up. And even the professionals in the field we talk to say it doesn't make sense. You, you know, you said, well, what's the new curricular content? You know, <laughs> what's the, the right. getting, what's, the, what's, uh, what's being added? And they said, you know, about $50,000. Yeah. Yeah. And, and well, we've got a world where we have young people entering their first serious jobs, half a million dollars in debt. And that is a major it's problem. It's just gobsmacking. And licensing is a tool that can contribute to that. Um, it's, it, there's not an easy solution to a lot of this stuff, but it's certainly something to look out for. And it's very hard to argue against ever more education, um, you know. Well, so, but in and some I think cases, the, the plus of our workforce development work in this state uh, is that we are going back to exactly what you're talking about here, which is uh, looking at relooking at apprenticeship <coughs> and, uh, and uh, really underscoring the value of, I like the way you describe it, underappreciated, apprenticeships are underappreciated and uh, that we should be looking at, um, and what was your nice word you used, disuse, that have fallen into disuse and that, that should be revived. And, and I think they are being slowly revived. Yeah, they are being. And, the and CTE programs, the better the CTE program, the better that. Revivification is uh, very true, and the, and the I should say there I kind of make the colleges the bad guy. Not always, you know. In in funeral service, for example, uh, CCV has been a critical component of. We had a funeral service model that was the, our board. Um, in addition to saying it wanted to switch to an advisor model, said we want to get out of the national model for funeral service because the nearest school, I think, was Boston, and then you had to go to like Minnesota or New York. Well, that's great. The school that graduated most new funeral directors in New York had a big testing scandal that threatened the licenses of half the funeral directors in New York, caused a huge mess. The whole system fall, fell apart, but at a kind of an opportune time because it, everybody stepped back and we said, wait a second, you know. Why don't we have a system where a Vermonter who wants to get into the field can do that without leaving the state of Vermont for two years and without going fifty or seventy thousand dollars into debt? And it turned out we can do that. We, we uh, the Funeral Directors Association worked with CCV and their uh, and their curriculum director. Um, we got heads together. They came up with I think it's a eight or twelve course sequence, um, right? Where they said, you know, here are the core things. You know. Uh, Bereavement and and counseling and the right. business uh, business law etc. and the basic I'll stave off the mob and then <laughs> and and then um, some period of apprenticeship and it, it, yeah paired with apprenticeship and right. so the net cost of say, going from say, identifying funeral directorship as something you want to do to being licensed it will fall dramatically and the um, optician by 60% was the analysis it, it yeah. should be amazing yeah. um, and the opticianry um, 
field is also an excellent example. It used to be uh, that an associate's degree, it was kind of a mostly disused, somewhat used apprenticeship, but generally speaking, you had to leave the state, because I don't even think we had an optician program anymore, get an associate's degree. We were just talking with a witness um, upstairs about the optician amendment. He said, well, you need you know, about $5,000 a, a semester for four semesters, it's about $20,000. Um, the, the career progression program that is recognized in this year's OPR bill costs $900 and you can do it online cool. if you get the digital books. If you want hard copy, they charge you $1,100 and they'll finance it. Um, so that may, and so we will, can take that field from one where you had to leave the state of Vermont to get the formal training and be five figures in debt to one where a Vermonter who may not have any available cash can initiate that training and do it from home. Which, which is great and supports our state college system all at the same time. Exactly. I think, I think there are opportunities the one, to so much, but the CCB one. Which CCB offers that, the uh, funeral? They're offering it through a lot of it through distance learning. Many of what they many of the core courses. I mean, when when I met with them, I met at the Winooski campus, but um, it will be available. I think the, the most of the courses in that sequence do require some physical attendance, but it's limited, and so most of the course instruction can be had online. So if you, I think uh, it's opening fall of nineteen. Is that that's right? They're this waiting. fall. For this fall. So, and some of these good ideas have come from the regulated community itself. Um, funeral and op optician um, certainly have. Some of them require the state to say, don't be so protective and of your marketplace. Um, and so that can be sometimes a, a, a hard, harder conversation. Funeral is a fairly easy conversation because um, and dentistry was a fairly easy conversation, just anecdotally, because those two communities um, were struggling to find people to buy their practices. Um, there was, there was, I had one correspondent when I was general counsel for dentistry. Um, I had like a pen pal, a woman in Rutland who was wanting to sell their practice and couldn't find anybody, um, a dentist, and just she just was like, please do this. I have a buyer, but she just needs to get a license and you can do it and please do it. Um, and it had the support of the association, so that was a very successful story. But that really came from the community yeah. having a desperate need. Other times, um, it, this, it's a really a place where there needs to be active state supervision to say, no, this is an unnecessary barrier you're putting up. Um, we don't need to do that. Um, you haven't thought about X, Y, Z, and B, um, and all the implications that can have. So we see it in two um, ways, coming from the profession and also from us saying to the profession, don't do this. Right? Thank you. I'm, I'm going to read this before next week. What day are they on deck? Thursday? Friday. Friday at 1.15, I think. Oh, we're going to save the best for last. <coughs> right? Unless it's... Oh, still okay. You gave it to me. Did I give it back to you? Okay. Um, all right. All right. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a neat issue. Okay. Well, and we will make sure that our other... Um, committees are aware of the, I think this is going to be one of the things that we kind of as a whole Senate are going to, in different committees are going to look at the, um, now if we could just get you to solve getting, um, <clears throat> is it H15, H1B? visas for our undocumented dairy workers. Could we please do that? Federal immigration policy is its own is its I, own monster and unfortunately it's lurking behind this whole thing. Uh, yeah, I know. It is. It is. It's the backdrop. Anyway. Okay, so thank you. Thank you.